Hey guys, it's Jessica. And this is Kendra. And you're listening to Lucid, Lucid Lab. Lab. It's technically the day after Christmas when you're hearing this. Yep. Yep. Hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. You're probably still, I hope, off of work today if you are fortunate enough to be in a position like that. But since it's not that day right now, I have some beef to spill because I'm so tired of being scammed with online shopping. Specifically when you're buying like used stuff or things through sites like Mercari. And I, yes, if you've listened to episodes from the very beginning, have participated. Like I sell stuff on some of these sites like Poshmark, right. Mercari, stuff like that. And I haven't had bad service or things go wrong. Right. Usually ever. But for some reason, it's happened twice in a row this oh, no. week. And one of them was a really, really big purchase. Like I'm talking hundreds. Okay. Right. I'm so mad. I waited forever for it to come in. And this fucking guy scammed me. Oh, no. Instead of what would have been a really big box, I get to the post office and I am given something in a tiny little envelope. And you're like, OK, already I'm pissed. Mm-hmm. And I open it and it was a single Pokemon card, which is not what you ordered. <laughs> which I'm is guessing. not what I ordered. And so now I'm going through the hassle of of getting it back to the scammer so I can get my money back because they already charged me on it. Of course they did. And it's hundreds of dollars. So I'm waiting for my money back during Christmas time. Is that Pokemon card worth? I love it. It's like dollars? $10. Oh, it so is a nice one, but it's like a $10 card. It's not like you could go sell it somewhere and make a thousand. Not for hundreds of dollars. No. Yeah. <laughs> and then I bought this other thing and it was supposed to be this set. I won't say what it was, but I ended up getting only one of the eight things that was supposed to come with it. And the seller is not, even though they have amazing reviews and they've sold a lot of stuff, is not responding to me. That is infuriating. I'm just like done. (laughs) I'm so mad. (laughs) And especially when you're trying to get something like a collectible, I'm guessing is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. People, for whatever reason, in that space scam people even more than anywhere else. Yeah. They send counterfeit bullshit. I've heard of this over the years and I know because both my kids are into collectible type things and yeah. people are desperate for money right now because we're all hurting but mm-hmm. don't make your money screwing other normal people over yeah. who are spending their hard earned money to try and get something special. It's just not a good thing to do. I don't know how you live with yourself. I know. I'm just so mad that my money is held up somewhere else right now because of it. And now I don't know what to do. It was an item I couldn't afford in a different way because typically it's sold for more. And I thought I was getting a deal. And I guess I fell for it. Yeah. Sometimes it's like too good to be true. Mm -hmm. But you always want to hope that it's just you found the right deal. You're trusting people. I always trust people first. And that's always been my flaw. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Because you want to think of people having the same like ethics and morals that you do. Yeah. I imagine that everyone is innately good to begin with and they make bad choices. But because this is coming out the day after Christmas, I figured I had to give you what I wanted to give you right now on this episode. Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Thank you. Ooh. So I got a really cool water bottle, which I need a new one because mine That's is a weed exactly one. exactly why I got you a new water bottle. <laughs> and because it's a Stanley. Oh my God. You guys don't know, but Kendra has this water bottle and it has a screw top. And so a lot during the episode, she's constantly screwing it back and forth. And I'm like, okay. Stop it. <laughs> Stop. That's noisy. It's because... But this one pops open. Just take a sip. You can close it without making as much noise. <gasps> The bottle I have right now with the screw top, the reason I have it is because my other one broke and this is one that Drew got free (laughs) from like a company that he works with. Uh. And then I got some wine, some fancy wine. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Today is the 26th and I'm going to be covering probably, I think, the most famous case in America. And it happened on December 26th. So Mm -hmm. we've got another kind of serendipitous moment that's come together because now we're on the 27th anniversary of John Benet Ramsey's death. And that's, that's the crazy. case where, yeah. yeah. I've been waiting for this one. And just so you guys know, we've actually never planned when these episodes are coming out on the days. When I released Krampus, I didn't know it was Krampus Day that day. <laughs> that was really Yeah, crazy. we didn't know. And then this one, as you're putting it together, just the way it ended up, and then you realized it's coming out the day of her death. The anniversary or when she of her was death. found. Yeah. Yes. It's just been ending up that way. It's Pretty cool. And when you did Julie Buskin, it came out like the week that he was he was being executed. Yeah, and I didn't plan that either. I didn't yes. find that out until the end of my research that, oh, my gosh, he's right. 
I want to do John Bonet. I spent more time researching this case than I think I've spent on any case because oh, yeah. anyone who knows John Bonet Ramsey, there is a lot of rabbit holes. And mm-hmm. I think I changed my mind multiple times while looking at it on what I thought happened. So let's go ahead and start talking about it. So six year old John Bonet Ramsey, she made national headlines when she was found murdered inside of her home on December 26, 1996. Mm hmm. It became a media firestorm as soon as they got their hands on images of John Bonet as a beautiful little pageant queen. Yeah. As soon as that happened, things kind of got out of control. The media storm combined with an inexperienced police and justice department in Boulder, Colorado, led to a crime that may never be solved. I think it's going to be really hard to ever solve this one. The crime scene was tainted from the first minutes that the cops arrived. The investigation was led by a police department that didn't even have a homicide division, and they had a police chief that didn't always want to take outside help when it was offered. Those egos, they could get in the way. We also had a district attorney's office that was either inept, being that they never actually prosecuted anyone, and they relied more on plea deals instead, even in cases of murder. The DA's office may have also been influenced and perhaps even swayed by the politics of it all when dealing with the rich and influential Ramsey family. After all, the Ramsey family would become the primary suspects because that's what the evidence would show as the Boulder Police Department began their investigation. And then you add into the mix that the setting for the murder of John Bonet happened in Boulder, Colorado. It's where I live. (laughs) Yeah. And it's also a town where something like this was just unfathomable. Uh, Boulder, Colorado is a place similar, I think, to the Martha Moxley story with Greenwich, Connecticut. People move to Boulder because it's a safe community. That and just it's different, you know, from other cities. Yeah. And a lot of that will play into this. I've lived in the Boulder area for the past nine years, and I'm Mm -hmm. very familiar with how things happen. And reading this totally makes sense to me because Boulder is a very, very left leaning liberal town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which can be good in a lot of ways, but not when it comes to a murder investigation. Yeah. Because what we see is that the district attorney's office and even the police chief at the time and probably still today, they want to believe that everyone can be reformed and that people are good, innately good, kind of like (laughs) what we were just talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But when you are dealing with a six-year-old child that was murdered, Mm -hmm. you can't just believe there's good people in the world. And you can't just write off that a parent could never do this to a child. Exactly. And a lot of those kinds of things were happening. And there was this clash between the police department and the district attorney's office, the district attorneys, the people that they hired to work there and who would get elected by the bolder populace Mm -hmm. is somebody who's not going to be very hard-nosed. Oh, okay. If that makes sense. They're not going to take people and prosecute them. Like I said, they had a long record of only giving plea deals, even in murder situations. Wow. They didn't believe in the death penalty. They didn't Mm -hmm. believe. So if you think about it from that lens, as we go into talking about this, that could be a reason that they never brought somebody, indicted them or wanted to bring them to conviction because this would have been a death penalty case. And they had qualms about it. Yeah, they didn't want to be the death penalty place. You know what's interesting about Boulder? I actually love Boulder. Yeah. I love Boulder a lot. But it's not that I feel safe there. I actually feel less safe in Boulder than anywhere else. And maybe it's all the podcasts I've listened to. But there's a lot lot of fucked up people who like to stop in Boulder to do some stuff. It's like this little mecca for fucked up people. And I don't know why. You go in downtown Boulder right now and we have people who are addicts running around. There's one guy in downtown Boulder right now that runs around and sings death metal. Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> no, it's not. When Why you're just not? walking around and you know he's not in his right mind and he comes running at you screaming. Oh, like, he's like a Krampus. Not. Yes, kind of. He's a Krampus. And he's so loud. You hear him from streets over and you're just like, oh, I wow. got to duck into a store or something because he's scary. It's something like that where everybody's aware of someone. Why aren't people stepping forward and trying to help this person? Well, then we go back to the police department and I am going to reference and I probably have all of this written later. So I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but I am going to reference a book written by Detective Steve Thomas, who worked on the Boulder Police Department during the John Bonet Ramsey case. He came from other harder nosed cities like Denver. I think he came from Broomfield and he was just talking about it was the way that they were led in the police department was just to assume everyone was good and try and resolve things in a very kind way, which I agree with. But there are times when you need your police department to be very strong when you have a man running 
running around scaring citizens, but they're afraid to do that. And the detectives that they hire are not that kind of personality. It's about weeding out different things when you're approaching a case. Every case should be handled uniquely for that case. I do want to take the approach that they've taken, at least back then. Right. Assuming goodness, because it is. You don't get to... You are... Innocent until proven guilty. Yes. I mean, that's how it should be because most police departments are the opposite. Correct. You're guilty first and they're really harsh about everything. So it needs to be a good mix. But maybe this police department was just a little too far. Yeah. In the other direction. So it's like the pendulum can swing too far. You need a good balance. I feel like Boulder probably had too far left leaning balance too soft. And we'll talk about how that affects this case. Maybe it's because they don't want to work. They're like, it's Boulder. We're here to relax. And they just don't have the experience because people who come to the Boulder Police Department, they're not dealing with murders every day. They're dealing with petty crimes. Like somebody's bike was stolen off the campus. (laughs) Not violent crimes because there is a college here as well. I've been on that campus quite a bit too. Yes. It's a beautiful campus. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty town. I have actually driven by John Bonet Ramsey's home I don't know, countless times because Drew's oldest son, his best friend literally lives like three doors down. That's crazy. From the Ramsey home. So I've driven by it every day. And quite honestly, I am not someone who has ever investigated John Bonet. I've heard things over the years, but I had no real idea about the case or even who I thought did it. So oh, I was coming okay. in with completely fresh eyes. Yeah, when you told me you were thinking about doing this one, I'm like, are you sure, Kendra? That is a road that's going to take you a bit. So much so we actually had to. We pushed it out a couple times. <laughs> off a couple times. Yeah, because she kept finding more and more and more. And I'm like, this is the longest episode I have ever written. So <laughs> hopefully it's not five hours today. This episode is releasing, like I said, on the 27th anniversary of John Bonet's death. And it feels like we are no closer to conviction of a killer than we were in 1996. If anything, we probably have more people. It's probably harder to yeah. decide. There are many opinions out there on who committed this heinous crime, and I will not be shy today about sharing what I think happened and what theory I believe is most likely, but I'm going to save that for the end. (laughs) There are two main theories when it comes to who killed her. Either someone in the family did it or an intruder came in and killed her. Right. Outside of the three members of the Ramsey family, which we will go into a lot of detail on here in a minute, the media has also reported on others that were deemed suspicious. From the convicted child sex offender, to the housekeeper, to the electrician, to even the Boulder Town Santa Claus. <laughs> Despite all these theories and evidence to back portions of the case up, no one has ever been indicted or convicted in the crime. I fear no one ever will be. And I will even quote an off the record person from the district attorney's office who said many years ago that this case was simply not prosecutable. I'll bring that back on why I think that later. Okay. In prepping for this episode, I have read countless books. I listen to several podcasts <laughs> and I watch many documentaries and interviews with the family. I also got lost in the Reddit yeah, <laughs> pages, for sure. which is really, really fun. I have truly been living and absorbing these details for over a month now to make sure I can bring this story the justice that I think it deserves. But before diving into all the details, I wanted to read a statement from the Boulder Police Department that was released last year on the 26th anniversary of John Bonet's death. So the statement from the Boulder Police Department says, Since John Binet's murder, detectives have investigated leads stemming from more than 21,000 tips, letters, and emails. We have traveled to 19 states to interview or speak with more than 1,000 individuals. This investigation continues to receive assistance from federal, state, and local partners. The amount of DNA evidence available for analysis is extremely small and complex. The sample could, in whole or in part, be consumed by DNA testing. I'm bringing this up because it's important <laughs> later. Yeah, because everybody's like, why don't we just do it? In collaboration with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and the FBI, there have been several discussions with private DNA labs about the viability of continued testing of DNA recovered from the crime scene and genetic genealogy analysis. Those discussions will continue whenever there is a proven technology that can reliably test forensic samples consistent with the samples we have available in the case additional analysis will be conducted oh the dna what i love is that we've already talked about touch dna which is going to be a big piece of the john Monet. and so many people are like just test the dna that will tell you the answers (laughs) and this is coming straight from the police department who i know people say that they fucked up the investigation but they have done a lot i think more than they've been given credit Right. And they're doing with what they can. And we have to trust that if it was something they could have easily done with DNA and proven, I think they would have done it by now. Right. Unless there's like a trademark 
to the John Bonet mystery. Like someone owns it all <laughs> and you can't solve it so that it can continue to make money, money and stay in the headlines for decades. I mean, maybe the Ramsey family Is owns it. Is that a thing? Do they trademark crimes? I wonder. Did I just give a bad person an idea? Can you trademark <laughs> something like that? The crime has left a hole in the hearts of many, and we will never stop investigating until we find John Binet's killer. This is from the police chief, Maris Harold. That includes following up on every lead and working with our policing partners and DNA experts around the country to solve this tragic case. This investigation has always been and will continue to be a priority for the Boulder Police Department. The case that haunts them forever. This case has ruined marriages, yeah. families. It's caused police detectives to give up the trade altogether. This is a very hard case. And I know just spending a month on it, I can see how you would get <laughs> obsessed with it. Right. And if it's the only thing you're stuck on, it literally becomes your life. Yes. And you then have to start weighing, was this worth these years of my life? And you gather all this evidence and it goes nowhere. And as a mm -hmm. police detective, it just causes you to give up and lose faith in the system. And a lot of detectives on job and a did. Yeah. So before I go into all the case details, and because this is a very famous case that most people probably have heard many times over at this point, I have said before, we all have theories. And I know you, Jessica, probably have one, too. <laughs> I do. So what I thought would be cool is I want us to both write down right now who we think is responsible mm -hmm. for the death of John Binet. OK. I'm then going to go into all of the evidence and information I've been able to find in the past month. We can have discussions back and forth about all the theories. And then I want to see, I'm curious if either of us changes our mind from where we sit right now at this moment. I know, because sometimes when we start talking, you or I have, change. Yeah. We, even with our own research, right. as we're talking, we'll change our minds from our own research because of the banter we have back and forth. So this is interesting. So I thought it would be fun to do this. So we both have it in our phone and we know. Yep. But it's written, so I can't I can't lie to you later. <laughs> I'm putting it in all caps with exclamations. OK. okay. And we're going to show it to each other at the end. OK. OK. This is one of. The <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. You just got me all jittery. This is one of the craziest cases I've ever encountered. I can tell you that I personally changed my mind at least three times uh, while researching. OK. Even with all the options available, I swear there is always one. But what about this to every single theory that you can think of? And it will bring a shred of doubt into what you believe. There's doubt even in what I wrote down. Exactly. Because nothing's perfect. Right. Nothing lines up perfect. You kind of just have to choose an evil. Yes. A monk her in her life. It's a complicated one. And I can personally see why detectives have, like I said, left their whole trade. And also many of them got into heated arguments amongst themselves. Oh, they I, all yeah. were fighting over what happened. Because you're supposed to come to a consensus on who's the and bad can't. guy. And you can't. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning before we get into the crime scene and investigation details. I want to start with talking about the Ramsey family, who they were, what their lives were like before they were thrust in the spotlight for years and years following John Bonet's death. Let's start with the patriarch, John Ramsey. He is still alive today and he's very active, visible and vocal about finding his daughter's killer. Yep, I have seen that. So John Bennett Ramsey was born in Lincoln, Nebraska on December 7th, 1943. He was the son of Mary Jane Bennett and James Dudley Ramsey, who was a decorated World War II pilot. John Ramsey would attend Okemos High School in Michigan. He would go on to Michigan State University and graduate in 1966 with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. So he's a pretty smart guy. Yeah. At Michigan State University, he met his first wife, Lucinda, and they would marry right before he joined the U.S. Navy and then was shipped off and stationed at Subic Bay in the Philippines. Oh, OK. John served as a civil engineer corps officer in the Philippines for three years. John and Lucinda moved to Atlanta in 1973 from the Philippines and Ramsey accepted a computer sales job. By that time, the couple had welcomed three children before their marriage would dissolve in 1977 because John would have an affair with his secretary. Who was Monica. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> His children were Elizabeth, Melinda, and John Andrew. And at the time that their parents divorced, Elizabeth was eight, Melinda was five, and John Andrew was four. Okay, so all still youngins. John Ramsey would meet Patricia Powell, and the two would marry just three years after his divorce in 1980. 
More about her in a minute. That's the mom, right? Pat. Yes, Patsy. Mm-hmm. As Ramsey started the computer company that would grow into Access, the couple lived just north of Atlanta for much of the 1980s, and they would have a son, Burke, in 1987, and then John Binet would be born three years later. John Ramsey would merge his computer company with two other firms in 1988 and would form the Boulder-based Access Graphics. And in 1991, Lockheed Martin actually would acquire it, and that would make John Ramsey president and very rich. Very, very rich. Lockheed Martin. Yes. Yikes. He became a multimillionaire mm-hmm. pretty much overnight. After more than a year of commuting from Atlanta, Ramsey decided he would move his family to Boulder in 1991. And they purchased a Tudor style mansion for $500,000. Which isn't that much. You can't buy a one bedroom condo in Boulder, Colorado for $500,000 right. these days. <laughs> so yeah, but back then, I guess that was a lot of money. By 1996, Access was booming. On December 20th of that year, the company celebrated its first billion dollar year. Whoa. And Ramsey was named Entrepreneur of the Year by the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. But just six days after that, John would find his daughter, John Binet's body, in the basement of their Boulder home. Immediately following the murder of his daughter, he was temporarily replaced, so the company did not have to bother him about business matters as he grieved. But Ramsey returned to his job within weeks. I always get that. Like, especially if you were a workaholic before. And he was. You know, it'd be really hard to just sit there twiddling your thumbs for a really long time. And weeks is, at least it wasn't the next day. Some people do that because they don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. Weeks. And John Ramsey was a workaholic. He was gone often. There are many comments from the family, even from John Bonet before she passed away, saying that she wished her dad was home more. Yeah. He was building a business. He was making a lot of money. And it really left Patsy and the kids home alone quite often. Right. And that's why you can also imagine that an intruder is possible just because he was an important guy and they just hit their billion dollar mark. Yes. He was all over the papers. You don't know what's going on high up with all of that. Hicks. After the death of John Monet, John quickly relocated his family from Boulder back to Atlanta and has stated many times that it was the right thing to do since Atlanta was really always their home. Right after. So before I go into Patsy, who is the matriarch of the family, I did want to briefly talk about the three oldest Ramsey children that John brought into the marriage and were the older step siblings to John Bonet. Mm -hmm. So there was Elizabeth Ramsey. She was John Binet's oldest sibling, and she would have been 11 years old when John and Patsy got married. She was born in the Philippines on July 15th, 1969. They called her Beth. No one ever actually goes by Elizabeth, except Except our our Elizabeth. (laughs) (laughs) She was John Binet's half sister, and sadly, she would precede her in death. She passed away when John Binet was only two years old. So they never really had a relationship. Beth was a Delta flight attendant and she and her boyfriend, Matthew Darrington, who was 22, they died when their car collided with a bakery truck near Chicago during an ice storm. Oh, that's It sad. killed both of them. Yeah. Darrington was the one driving and there was no tickets. It was just purely an accident. Yeah. So she died in... January of 1992 at the age of 22, and she was buried in Marietta, Georgia. John Bonet would actually be buried right next to her years later. Young deaths are hard. This was devastating for John Ramsey when his oldest daughter passed away. They Mm -hmm. said he was inconsolable. Second child that came into the marriage with John was Melinda. She was born in 1972, and she lives in the Atlanta area. At the time of John Bonet's death, Melinda was 24 years old. She was actually en route to meet the family in Michigan for the holidays. And she loved little John Bonet. And she said, in a way, she was almost like an aunt to yeah. John Bonet because she was 24 years old. Yeah. But she loved that little girl. How do you not? Have right. you seen her? She's adorable. <laughs> Then there is John Andrew. He was John Binet's oldest brother. He was born in 1973, and at the time of her death, he was 23 years old. He was in Atlanta for the holidays when her body was found. At one point, he was a suspect, and we'll talk a little okay. bit about that. He's not a very viable suspect, but I'll yeah. let you know why people thought he might be. John Andrew has spent most of his life fighting for his sister's justice and pushing the police to pursue DNA testing. Mm. So John Andrew is very vocal along with his dad. They are the two that have propagated the idea that the Boulder Police Department doesn't want to work with them. Okay. But we're going to go into more of that because I don't think I agree with that. 
Okay. John Andrews believes the killer is still alive and decided to murder his sister for some kind of sick fantasy. Outside of finding justice for his sister, John's personal life details are not very well known. He keeps a very private life. So those are the three kids from John Ramsey's first marriage. And as I said, he met Patsy and she was born in Parkersburg, West Virginia on December 29th, 1956. She was the daughter of Nedra Reimer and Donald Ray Powell, who was an engineer and manager at Union Carbide. So she grew up in a very middle class family. Okay. She attended West Virginia University. She belonged to the Alpha Xi Delta sorority and she graduated in 1978 with a bachelor's in journalism. In 1977, she won the Miss West Virginia Beauty title. She was gorgeous. Her sister, Pamela, also was a beauty queen and won Miss West Virginia just two years later after her sister. Patsy and Pamela. (laughs) (laughs) Patsy met John Ramsey through a mutual group of friends she was hanging out with one summer. And they said, John Ramsey is coming. He's an Atlanta businessman. He was 13 years older than her. She Um, had just graduated from college. Okay. She was only 23 years old when she married John. He was 36 and he came as a package deal. So at a very young age, Patsy was thrust into this role of stepmom and homemaker. She never worked her own career. She never actually like worked, worked. I mean, she was working because she's taking care of three kids that were not her own, but she... Not the entire time though. They have a mom. Yes, true. She was half time mom. Six years after they got married, Patsy would get pregnant with her first child, and that was Burke Ramsey. And then she gave birth to John Bonet. She was all about the mom and socialite lifestyle. Yeah. She was a perfectionist. It kind of goes along the lines of she was a beauty queen. Right. She was used to being in the public image, and she liked that attention. Mm Mm-hmm. And she liked maintaining that perfect family image to the outside world. She was married to a very rich man. Yeah. She had the main job of making him look good and making sure that their home looked good. And she was actively involved with many charities. There is the known rumor out there that she spent $30,000 for just one party at their house. Yeah. She was always very well dressed. She always had her hair done, perfect makeup. And she was, I guess, what you'd want to call the epitome of like a trophy wife to John Ramsey. I just imagine like a director of Mary Kay. Yes. (laughs) That's what I imagine. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. If Patsy was alive during this TikTok time, she would have been an influencer. Yeah. That's who she is. Yeah. She wanted her kids to be perfect, too. Of course. Every picture you see of this family, you can just tell. She put a lot of time into thinking about how they were presenting to the outside world. That's why they were miserable. (laughs) I think it's really important to know this about somebody because it can answer some questions when we go into details later about like, how could you ever think that a parent would hurt their child? Yeah. When you are trying to portray a perfection, I would even say in all of the research that I've done, I believe wholeheartedly that both John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey are narcissists. I feel like to have the life that they did and to be doing what they were doing, it's almost a requirement is you have to be a narcissist, maybe not to everybody, but to a lot of people that are in your inner circle. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't have it all. Or maybe you go crazy trying to have it all or trying to keep it, Do it all. together. That's why all my, oh, everybody's good. Like, I know if I were to ever get to a certain level, I can't imagine that continuing to be my stance because then people look at you differently and treat you differently. And so you almost have to change Mm -hmm. to protect yourself. There's like this ceiling almost. Yeah. So if you make too much money, that's when you have to like change. It's true. Money brings you a lot of freedom in a way because you can do things, but it also traps you in a lot of ways. And I feel like Patsy was trapped into that. She wanted it. She was already into the beauty queen circuit, which I feel like, and I'm not going to go down what I believe about the beauty pageant industry. I'm not a fan, but for the women who want to be part of that, it's a certain personality type. Yep. And I think it goes along with narcissism. That's just my two cents. So when John Bonet was around age four, Patsy began entering her into the child beauty pageants. Yeah. We all know about this. We've seen so many pictures. Think what you will about it. It does open you up to an interesting segment of society. Child beauty pageants. I guess they still happen today. I've never watched Toddlers and Tiaras, but I've heard about it. I haven't either. I can imagine the type of moms that that requires because it's a child. 
Yes. And you're making them do this weird fucking shit. And there is a lot out there about what the relationship must have been like between Patsy and John Bonet. She swears up and down, and so does John Ramsey, that the only reason she was in pageants is because John Bonet wanted to be in them herself. That John Bonet saw pictures of her when she was younger in beauty pageants and saw some of her old gowns yeah. and thought it would be fun, which I believe at yeah, four I years old that too. dressing up. Is yeah. probably fun, but I don't know that she realized what all that comes with. She might have liked performing. She right. might be like my kid. My kid loves being on a stage. She right. Would, she soaks up that shit like sun. And so she could be that kid. But I'm sure it just got to points, too, where she's like, I just want to be a kid, though. Can I, I just want to stay home? But you have to be a part of all these different levels. So I'm sure if it did start out as something that she wanted to do, she didn't know how many things she would have to be involved with to keep Correct. it going. Patsy was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer in 1993 at the age of 36, which is also the time mm-hmm. that she started entering John Bonet into contests. So I think there is a relation there because I was I'm psychoanalyzing Patsy, but she didn't feel like she had a lot of time left. And she said this was okay. something fun for a her project. to do with her daughter, a way to bond with her in her last years, possibly. And I could totally see that. Yeah. And her daughter had interest and she sounded very sincere in the interview I saw. She's like, I just thought it would be something fun for us to do together. Yeah. And she almost chokes up talking about it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I don't think she was this horrible show mom that yeah. was just putting her daughter out as a show pony. I think she entered into it with good intent. Yeah, I think so too. I've never really looked at it as, wow, you're an abusive mom. Look at what you're no. doing. I actually have never seen her that way. Me neither, actually. Okay. I think she has some narcissistic tendencies and she wants to portray perfectionism. I don't think that she was abusing John Bonet in the sense of pushing her out on the stage. John Bonet was a Leo. Okay. That's my daughter. She's a Leo. Leo's love being center of attention. Yeah. It makes sense to me. Perfect. Yeah. That's why I'm like, I understand this little kid. If I'm looking at my own kid, I get it. You know what's funny is Patsy's a Capricorn. She's a Capricorn mom with a Leo daughter. So that's me. (laughs) So you can relate. I can relate. I've just always seen their relationship. Patsy Ramsey did have stage four ovarian cancer and she was going through it for a while. She was in remission when John Bonet was killed. Uh I also saw quite a bit about, you know, all the treatments she went through. And it does not sound like John Ramsey was that supportive. Uh I think she was doing a lot of this on her own. I was reading about her having to fly to treatments and he wasn't there with her. Yeah. Yeah. So I empathize with her because she had a lot on her shoulders. She's yeah. trying to keep the perfect family. Her husband's gone all the time and she's fucking fighting cancer. ovarian cancer Yeah, and wondering if she's going to survive it with her two little children at home. That's so hard. In a 2012 interview, John Ramsey told CBS he felt that Patsy was not an overbearing mother and that the media's poor portrayal of her had been an unfair angle. He said, Patsy had just come out of cancer treatments. I think deep down, she didn't know how long she had to live and how much time she had to spend with her child. So she just tried to pack as much as she could into every day. As you would do. I'm sorry. That is what you would do. Sadly, Patsy Ramsey's cancer would return and she did pass away in June of 2006 at the young age of 49 years old. Oh, that's so hard. Anything having to do with breast cancer, ovarian, because it's all linked. My mom's yes. had it all. It's horrible. And it started with breast cancer. So I really feel it's for women horrible. going through it. Patsy Ramsey is also buried next to John Bonet and Beth Ramsey in Marietta, Georgia. So the two children that Patsy and John had together, let's talk quickly about them. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about John Bonet, but let's talk about Burt. So he was born in Atlanta on January 27th, 1987. That would make him an Aquarius. Okay. He was nine years old when John Bonet was found dead in their family basement. There are indications that have been found during the investigation of his sister's murder that he may have struggled with mental and or behavioral issues as a child. Yeah. Perhaps even some sibling rivalry as his sister gained quite a bit of attention as the little beauty pageant queen. And you're just a stupid little boy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> In researching, though, I did see comments from several friends claiming that Burke was almost like Patsy's favored child. I even read that she would sometimes give him preferential treatment over John Bonet. That's coming from housekeepers and friends. So I don't know that there's a lot out there that would make it seem like he was ignored while mommy okay. was focusing on John yeah. Bonet. 
I saw kind of the opposite, actually, that he was her sweet little boy. Okay. You can love both two of them. children. <laughs> I have two children. At the same time. <laughs> and you love them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I don't know why they always try and pit they kids against each other. They just assume there's a favorite child and that child gets more than the other children. She did travel quite often with John Binet all over for the pageants. And I don't know. I did read that Burke went with her sometimes. Sometimes he would stay behind. So my guess is that if she had been gone for a week when she got home, she was probably giving special attention to Burke right. because yeah. mommy had been gone for a week. Right. There was also talk about and it was seen in pictures taken from the crime scene that there were some books in the home talking talking about like what's wrong with little Johnny and books that were written towards children explaining why there might be strange behavior from their sibling. And so a lot of people will oh. bring that up. And hmm. there were two other like medical books that were talking about behavioral issues in children that okay. had been gifted to Patsy from her mother, Nedra. Okay. So some of that is in there as we start talking through theories that make people believe that Burke may have had some behavioral issues that the family was working through. Right. In a 2016 interview commemorating the 20th anniversary of John Bonet's murder, Burke Ramsey admitted that he continued to talk to his sister for years after her death. Not only that, he believed Patsy and John Bonet were reunited in heaven and that they were both watching over him. He said that when he was in school, he would even ask John Bonet for help, like on tests. And he often wished that the two of them could still be together. Well, how is John Bonet going to help him with a test? Just going to slip him the answer. <laughs> <laughs> When John Bonet's murder happened, Burke was very shielded from everything by his parents. They did all possible to keep him out of the spotlight. You never saw interviews with him. They moved him quickly to Atlanta. They would not allow police to talk to him. Remember that they grew up in a home where image was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that was ingrained in both of their children. Right. And I just bring that up because a lot of people will say, why didn't Burke talk more? Wouldn't they be afraid if, you know, someone in the family had done something he would say? Because he was a kid then. He was nine years old. So. And even to this day, it's ingrained in him to keep a certain image of the family. And that's all I'm going to say about that right now. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to John Bonet. John Bonet was the youngest child born on August 6, 1990. She was named after her father, John Bennett, and her mother, Patricia. So that's how they got the name John Bonet, Patricia Ramsey. John Bonet was an outgoing little girl. By age six, she had already won multiple pageant titles thanks to her bouncy blonde hair. <sighs> Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> <laughs> her poised smile and her glittery costumes. Yep. Her parents doted on her in every way that they could. She lived a very luxurious life. Her home was plush with everything. She had a beautiful little room like a girl's Aww. dream. I've seen pictures. Yeah. I'm picturing my daughter right now because she just had a dance recital yesterday. So she was all done up and glittery yesterday. <laughs> and they love it. Now, a lot has been made of her pageant days and the media has really blown up there with the pictures. But the truth of the matter is she actually only participated in nine pageants altogether. OK, that's not very many. Which also goes back to Patsy wasn't this horrible show mom. She wasn't dance moms. No. <laughs> And I haven't really, I've seen a few episodes of that. Yes. And I'm like, thank God I am not one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would be too much for me. Way too much. So her mom did get her extravagant costumes. They had the money to get all of these professional photographs taken. But I think a lot of the things that are out there in the media were sold by the photographers. They weren't right. sold by the family. And it probably wasn't even all the pictures that they bought. Right. And so I think it looks more prevalent in her life than it actually was. When right. I read that she only did nine pageants, I'm like, okay. Like, that's not a lot. Over like two years. Yeah. Like, she was in dance. She was in other things that related to that singing voice yeah. lessons. OK. Sounds like my kid right now, to right. be honest. I think a lot of kids, like, right. I don't think that there was something wrong or overbearing about what John Bonet was doing with the pageants when I really did the research behind it. And if your kid doesn't want to go, you don't take them. Like, if my yes. daughter doesn't feel like going to dance one day, you don't go then. That's fine. Now, when John Bonet wasn't dressed to the hilt for her beauty competitions, it was said she was quite a tomboy. She, <laughs> That's my kid, too. <laughs> she loved rolling around in the mud, climbing trees, playing sports and running around with the neighborhood kids. She yep. was not the prissy little princess that she might appear to be in the images that are popularly displayed. You can do it all. 
I think a lot of women are that way too. Yeah. It's like, I like, look at me now. Look at I'm, us right now. You can't see us, but we <laughs> talked about this last time. We look homely right now. We are trolls, <laughs> but we can put ourselves but together. I can look fucking damn good when right, I want exactly. to and I enjoy it. <laughs> I was talking to my daughter about this the other day and she's like, mom, you're pretty. And I'm like, honey, Aww. before you were born, I was hot. Exactly. <laughs> I was <laughs> spicy. <laughs> I've had my days in the club. She's like, can I see pictures? And I was like, (laughs) sure, honey, sure. So based on interviews with housekeepers, family members, friends, and babysitters, it does appear John Bonet was having some troubles before her tragic death in 1996. She was reportedly wetting the bed quite often and having other kinds of toilet troubles. Oh, okay. Her aunt mentioned that John Bonet would often ask for someone to come in and help her in the bathroom. Interesting. She had also been to the pediatrician multiple times. Depending on the source, I read up to 18 times in the year leading up to her death. Oh, wow. That is a lot. While those records are private, some of those things still get out there. And it does appear that she had issues with vaginitis and UTIs. Some speculate, and we'll talk through this more, that this could be indication of ongoing sexual molestation happening before her death. Oh, yeah. Interesting. There is also a lot I was reading about Burke as well having toilet troubles and he would actually defecate in her bed sometimes. Yes, I know about the poop scenes. They slept together quite often, which is also kind of an indicator of maybe abuse coming from someone. Mm -hmm. The thought is that with both children having toilet issues, that is something that they see in children, especially at six and nine. That's not something by then you should have maybe gotten better about. So I bring that up because I think it's something to think about when you're theorizing what happened. Right. So now we know a little bit more about the family, the main cast of characters coming into the home on Christmas Day of 1996 going to get into the details of what happened to poor little John Bonet. So I'm going to start with just a basic timeline and then we'll go into investigation and theories. On December 23rd, 1996, the Ramses were hosting a Christmas party and they had about 30 guests present, including a man named Bill McReynolds, who was dressed up as Santa Claus right. because there was a lot of children at the party. Mm-hmm. He will come back into the story later. While this party was going on, a 911 call was made from the Ramsey home. But when the 911 operator asked who was there, nobody responded. Oh, OK. When questioned about it later, the Ramsey family says it had to have just been a drunk party guest that dialed 911. 911. I don't know. That seems weird to me. It's a specific number. I think it could be a foreshadowing of things to come. Mm -hmm. Some even suggest that John Benet made the call because something was already going on and Um, she wanted to tell someone. Yeah, it's possible. On Christmas Day, the Ramsey spent the morning opening gifts with the kids. Normal holiday. Both kids got new bikes for Christmas. There were pictures. They looked just like a normal Christmas morning. Right. They then went over for a Christmas party at their close friend's house. And those friends are the Whites. And they will come up quite often as well. They stayed there all afternoon and into the evening. And around 10 p.m. that night, they returned home and put both kids to bed. There is more to that part of the story, but I'm going to hold off on discussing until we get to the investigation. Okay. You'll see that many details like when they got home, when the kids went to bed, how the kids went to bed will become very important when trying to figure out timing what happened. and stuff like that. Yes. Yep. So at 12 a.m. on December 26th, kids should have already been in bed, but their neighbor, Scott Gibbons, remembers seeing a light on in the Ramsey's kitchen. Around 2 a.m., their neighbor, Melody Stanton, allegedly hears a scream coming from the Ramsey's home. Oh, Her husband then reportedly hears the sound of metal on concrete sometime after the scream. Uh, Krampus. (laughs) It's not Krampus Day. He's got to be gone by now. It's December 26th. (laughs) At 5.30 a.m. on the 26th, Patsy Ramsey wakes up and she comes down the back spiral staircase to go make coffee. The family was going to be headed to their Michigan vacation home on a private jet that was scheduled to leave around 6 30 a.m. Private jet. Yes. They live in a whole different world than us. Yep. The plan was that they would go there. They would meet John Ramsey's two older children and then they were all to go on a Disney cruise together. 
Wow. So they had plans. Yeah, that's a lot. As Patsy is walking down the stairs, she sees a couple of pages of paper and she picks it up and it appears to be a ransom note. I'm going to read the text of the ransom note. Okay. It says, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We do crossed out. The do is now crossed out. Respect your business misspelled, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession, also misspelled. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. Just not the misspelled ones. (laughs) (laughs) You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. <laughs> Stupid. It's the weirdest fucking note ever. <laughs> if we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence a earlier delivery crossed out pickup of your daughter. <laughs> Weird. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. Mm. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. (laughs) (laughs) If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. (laughs) You are not the only fat cat around here, so don't think that killing will be difficult. (laughs) Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good Southern common sense of yours. It's up to you now, John. Victory, SBTC. Some of the stuff that was brought up, it sounds foreign. Just the way of the captivity and the beheading and some of the misspellings. I'm not saying it's foreign, but that it's made to sound foreign. I'm not going to go into all the analysis of the ransom note right this minute because there's a lot. Yeah. But (laughs) it's a fucking weird note. It's fucking weird. (laughs) Don't deviate from my instructions, but I may change those without That's you knowing. I, so. I was laughing. And if it's and if it's here earlier, then I'll call you earlier and we'll like hook up earlier. Cool. <laughs> like, yeah, because like, just, I know you have the money and I want it right now. It's, so. it's really weird. I'm going to put myself in the place of Patsy. I just found this ransom note that said, don't call the police. Don't tell anybody. Don't fucking talk to a stray dog. Don't do anything <laughs> or we're going to behead your daughter. Yeah. As soon as she found this note, Patsy said she ran upstairs, opened John Monet's bedroom door. Right. And the child wasn't there. Right. That's the first thing you do. Then she went to find John, who she says was in the shower. And she told him she found this ransom note and John Monet was not in her bed. We don't really know what discussion happened, but at some point, the next things we know she did, because these are documented, is that at 5.45 a.m., so 15 minutes after finding the note, she called two of their sets of friends. She called Fleet and Priscilla White, which were the family friends that they were at the night before. Mm -hmm. And then John and Barbara Fernie, who is their other close friends, told them to come over to the house. John Minet has been kidnapped. At 5.52, so seven minutes later, that is when Patsy would call 911. And I want to play that 911 call. So thinking of it as your Patsy, that's what you said. Maybe she just needed more opinions on do I follow what this ransom is saying or do I call the cops? I don't know what to do. So my question to you, if you had woken up and you see a ransom note, your daughter's not in the house and it's very specific in there not to tell anybody, Mm -hmm. what would you do? I don't know. Because it says if you contact the authorities, we're going to behead your child. 
That's why I'm saying these are her closest friends. They're all good business people, whatever you want to call it. They're all smart. But if these people are watching your house, why would you call people to come to your That's house? That's true. That's where I get really tripped up in this because it says, don't even talk to a stray dog or we're going to kill your kid. And within 15 minutes, you're like, let me invite all my friends over. They also invited their reverend over. He's going to show up too. And they call the police. So they did everything opposite of what the note said. Right. Which seems suspicious. And a lot will say the reason is because the family knew the child was already dead. Okay. Yeah. But it's hard to know what you would do in that situation because we are all taught when you are in a emergency, you call 911. Yeah. I don't know what I would do, honestly. I don't either. So it's hard to fault them completely. Mm -hmm. I think I would have sat down with my husband and really, really reviewed the note. Right. And been like, what do you need to do? Patsy will say in interviews later, and even when she called 911, she didn't read the note at all. All she saw was, your daughter is missing set the note down and went to look at John Bonet. That is what she will oh, put into okay. official interviews. It's two pages, right? Yes. That's a lot to fucking read when the first thing you read is your kid's missing or we have your kid. Right. You're not going to sit there and read a two page document. That's a lot. It would yes. take a lot to read through. You're going to immediately start to panic. Go get your husband. Try and find her. So maybe she didn't read it. I, I don't know. But someone would have. John would have. John's, John's the type Mr. of person. John's Mr. CEO. Yeah. He would have stopped and he would have read yes. those two pages. Because your kid's already missing. And yeah. this is the only thing you have that tells you where exactly. your child is. Why would you not read it word for word? Yep. I will also say that this ransom note being two pages long is the only one that the FBI has ever seen in the history of ransom notes that was this long. And that was handwritten. Right. I'm now going to play the 911 call. It's enhanced, so there's some buzzing. <laughs> So what's interesting to note about the 911 call and what will come up in the investigation is that she did not stay on the line. Right. She thought she hung up, but you can hear some talking after she thinks she's hung up the phone. And there is an enhanced version. I personally can't tell. It just sounds like muffled. Right. It's like when people say that they hear ghosts talking Mm -hmm. and you can't hear. Right. So I'm not even going to bother trying to play that enhanced version. I actually listened to it, I don't know, probably a dozen times and I couldn't make any of it out. Right. But it does become a big part of evidence for the police. They actually sent it off to the Aerospace Corporation in Los Angeles and asked them to try and decipher the sounds behind the noise. And it came back with a pretty interesting conclusion. So she thought she was hanging up the phone, but as the phone was being cradled, because this is 1996 when we still had (laughs) actual telephones. Right. She was heard saying, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And then you can hear her husband, John, and he says, we're not talking to you. And then they also believe there was a third voice in the background, and it was a young sounding voice, which they believe to be John Bonet's brother, Burke, Mm -hmm. saying, what did you find? The Ramseys would repeatedly say that their son was not awake that morning. Mm. And that he did not wake at any point throughout the night. So that is why this becomes very controversial, yeah. controversial. So more on that later. Mm-hmm. So it's now 5.59 a.m. and the first officer arrives. His name's Officer French. Also, their friends are all coming over. So now they have the Whites and the Fernies and then their Reverend Hoverstock. They had victim advocates and crime scene investigators also showing up. So for a ransom note that said, do not contact the authorities, there are now probably like 20 people outside their house. Yeah. 
and they weren't in unmarked cars. They're showing up in like full on police cruisers with <laughs> the sirens great. going off. Yeah. So the only part of the house that was cordoned off at this point is John Benet's bedroom, but everything else is free reign. In fact, it's stated that one of Patsy's friends came over and started cleaning the kitchen, like Lysoling the counters, scrubbing down, picking up dishes. <laughs> yeah. Horrible for a crime scene. Yeah. When I was reading the book by Detective Thomas, he said that they were told by the police chief and the district attorney's office to make sure that they treated the family like victims and not like suspects. Okay. They don't know that she's murdered yet. They think it's just a kidnapping. Right. But still, I don't feel like they were following probably proper procedure. Of course not. Even for a kidnapping. There's going to be fingerprints and things. And you've got people trampling all over the house. And the only thing they've locked off is her bedroom. Which is so stupid. (laughs) I know. I'm not even a trained detective. (laughs) The whole house is a crime scene. They should have gotten everyone out of the house. But no, let's have a hundred people in there. And it's like a after Christmas party. Yes. And they're all hanging out in the kitchen. Yeah. And the cops come at six. They start telling everybody, let's just search the house. Maybe John Benet's here and she's hiding. And so you've got people trampling all over the house. Mm-hmm. There were actually detectives going down in the basement and looking around there. They took pictures. Yeah. They didn't see any sign of an intruder. They didn't see how anyone would have come into the home. They didn't see a direct path for them leaving with the child. So those were the things they were looking for. And they weren't seeing a lot. Right. At 8, 10 a.m., the first detective showed up. So right now we just have the regular, I guess, footmen, police officers. I don't know anything about like their rankings. But the first detective that showed up was Linda Arndt. There's a lot to be said about Linda Arndt. It doesn't sound like she was very versed in homicide or anything like that. She actually came from the sexual crimes division. Oh, let me go back a little bit. This is also Christmas time and the police department was understaffed. A lot of people are on holiday. Christmas isn't a big time for crime. I think a lot of the people who would have been called in and probably were more expert level were on vacation. Yeah. And so they were dealing with the the B string. (laughs) (laughs) So Linda Arndt is the top badge, I guess, as the detective. She should have been the one to secure the crime scene and really know what needs to be done as a detective. And she did not do any of that. And she was there three hours after. Yes. She was also there mostly because of the ransom note and because it had said in the note that they would be calling between 8 and 10 a.m. So she was playing two roles. She was trying to be the detective in a kidnapping and then also prep them and get them ready for when that call came in, how to respond to someone who's ransoming your child. From 8 to 10, they're all waiting for this call. No call ever comes. And what's really curious about this is nobody seems to care. Like the parents don't even pay attention. I would think. They didn't call. They didn't call. Oh my God, what's happening? They didn't call. Nobody That's what said you would anything. And so the cops are noticing all of this. Mm-hmm. Police are smart. They're trained to assess situations. And honestly, they just sit there and watch sometimes. Right. There were more friends that showed up. I can't even imagine. I'm trying to visualize it. Just people everywhere hanging yeah. out and freaking out. Linda Arndt says she loses track of John Ramsey. He's not anywhere around. She keeps looking because the call didn't come in. It's around 1030 a.m. And she realizes, I haven't seen John Ramsey in a while. Oh, She said at least an hour. She had no idea where John Ramsey was. When she does run into him again, she says his demeanor is completely changed from when she first saw him at 8 a.m. He's very reserved. She said he seems almost in a state of shock. Yeah. But she doesn't know why. Maybe he did freak out about the call not happening. I don't know. I don't know. There's too many people. I have a different theory, but (laughs) for whatever reason, Linda had written down in her notes that he said something about going to get the mail. So she believes he left the house at some point. Okay. I did read that he had sent a family friend or maybe a lawyer to the bank to see about getting the $118,000 that was in the ransom note, but it didn't seem like it was like this urgent thing they were trying to do. Okay. Linda Arndt, the whole time she's there by herself as the detective and she keeps calling for backup. She needed to know like that more detectives were coming because she couldn't secure. She even says that she's like, I was one person with like 20 adults around me and I could not secure this crime scene if I wanted to. Mm. I don't know if it's that or she was also very kind of a timid, bolder, hired police detective. So she was not assertive. She wasn't in your face. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas she and she was also told 
to treat them like victims and not suspects. And I've seen interviews with her and she kicks herself in the butt over it now, but she should have kicked them all out and started searching. Yes. What are you doing? Why are there so many people there? I would have immediately been like, get out. You weren't invited (laughs) by me. Get out. Yeah. This is an active crime scene. Yes. She's missing. So to me, that's baffling that they would allow this. And that's why I think the Boulder Police Department gets a lot of hate for how they handled it. Mm -hmm. So it's around 1 p.m. now. It's been seven hours since the first policeman showed up. They don't know where to go with it. And Linda Arndt is still waiting for backup. And finally, she said that she felt like she just needed to give somebody something to do because you had all these adults with energy. And she sees John Ramsey and she says, why don't you go search the house? And his friend Fleet White was like, I'll go with him. And they go down to the basement. Yep. Five minutes later, John Ramsey comes up the basement stairs carrying John Benet's body. When Linda Arndt sees him coming up the stairs with the six-year-old corpse, I guess at this point, she's like, oh, my God, you have to put her down. Yeah. She realizes... He just fucked everything up. He just fucked it up. Yeah. When John is interviewed, he says that he opened the door and immediately knew that John Bonet was there. And he just got excited thinking he had found his child and just picked her up. And he said he didn't realize she was dead until he picked her up. Oh. She had a piece of duct tape over her mouth and he ripped it off because I think he thought maybe she was just tied up or something. Yeah. And could breathe. So that was the first thing he did is he ripped the duct tape off her mouth. I mean, I would do that too. I think any parent would. And then he realized she wasn't breathing. Uh. Her hands were also pulled up behind her and tied loosely Mm -hmm. with a white cord. He had tried to untie her, but he said he in the panic or whatever, he just couldn't get it untied. So he just picked her body up and carried her up the stairs. Mm -hmm. There is a lot said to how he was carrying his daughter. They said he was carrying her very stiffly and away from him, not in a very warm, loving way parental Um, way which is something that the police will notate when he gets upstairs and linda says you need to set the body down he just puts her on the floor which police also think is odd like why would you not put your child like on on a couch couch? or something yeah i mean were people in the way i don't know i mean it seems like it was pretty packed maybe everyone was using the couches and everything else where else would he have put her when he sat the body down, Linda Arndt kneeled down next to him and looked across into John's eyes. And she maintains and still does to this day that she knew in that moment that he was the killer. Oh. She is a sex crimes detective. Yeah. And she said she knew something was off when she got to the house as she said there was an air of incest in the home. Well, he might have been her abuser. But maybe but not maybe, have killed her. But maybe not her killer. If he was her abuser, you know, we go back to the UTIs and all the issues that they had. Then, of course, he's going to be pretty heartbroken because he lost his little plaything. John Bonet was wrapped in a blanket that was hers. It was a little white blanket. And this is where John also says something odd. He says that it must have been someone who cared about her because he wrapped her up in a blanket. Oh, okay. Well, he watched one CSI show and he's like, (laughs) I know what this means. (laughs) So at that point, Linda Arndt puts out a call and says, this is not a kidnapping. It's a homicide. Get some detectives over here. I need help. And so by 1.30, all the detectives that she's been asking for for the last seven hours finally, I guess, that's fucking wake up and they show up. But at this point, things have been completely out of control in the house for almost seven hours. And that will forever haunt this investigation. Here's another weird thing. 1.30 p.m. is when the detectives arrive and one of them overhears John on the phone telling his pilot to prep the plane to leave. He wants to go to Atlanta. This is 10 minutes after the detectives showed up and his baby has been found murdered in his basement. And the first thing on his mind is I got to get out of town. Mm -hmm. There are some different stories, but the police did write down in their report that they asked him why he was going to Atlanta and he said he had a business meeting. I mean, he's an important guy, right? This was a family that was supposed to be leaving for Michigan and going on a Disney cruise. That's true. All of a sudden he has an important business meeting in Atlanta that he needs to get a plane right now after his daughter was found murdered. Yeah. Mm hmm. Seems we, weird. We did just watch Saltburn and rich people act weird when people die. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. 
the police say you can't leave town. Your daughter was just found murdered in your home. You need to stick around for a little bit. And so but you can't stay here. Basically, you got to get out of the house. And so they agree that they will stay at their friend's house, the Fernies. The police detectives were planning that at that point, now that it was a homicide, they would be able to interview each family member and do the normal investigative work that they do. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. You shouldn't have to tell someone, no, you don't get to jump on a plane and leave. I just think, (laughs) I'm sorry, that's shady as fuck. Yeah, it's shady. Your daughter was literally found 30 minutes ago. You would assume that you didn't know your daughter was dead until 30 minutes ago, but now you're already ready to skip town? Yep. When the body was found, after John just kind of dropped her on the floor, then Linda's like, let's move her to the couch. (laughs) And at that time, Patsy comes running out and she's like, oh my God, my baby. And she completely lays over the body and just is hugging her, you know, like a mom would do. Yeah, like a mom would do. Yeah. John didn't behave that way. So whatever. Patsy was definitely the bereaved mom and she was hugging her child, which a lot of people will say was a problem because then she's also disturbing the crime scene. Yeah. And then during all of this time, Burke was somehow awakened. He says he was awakened by a police detective. And as soon as he was awake, John and Patsy sent him away. Sent him away where? To be at his friend's house over at the White. Yeah. Yeah. You would do that, though. Okay, but they sent him away. I just want to bring this back (laughs) because this really bothers me. You have woken up. Your six-year-old child is missing. There's a ransom note saying that she has been kidnapped. You don't go and worry about your other child that's in the house? I know. And they literally didn't go wake him up. The only reason he woke up, supposedly, is because the police got him up. And then when he came downstairs, he's like, what's going on? His parents are like, you're going to go over to the White's house. Yeah. I have two children. If Mm -hmm. one of my oldest children had gone missing or my youngest children had, I would be like on my other child. My other child would be glued to me. Exactly. Yes, of course. It is weird. It is weird Do you think it's very odd behavior? It's also one of those things, again, that how do you know how to act when something's happening? I don't know. They didn't check in on him at all. There's not anything about that. No. Why would you openly admit? No, I didn't look in the room my son was sleeping (laughs) why why unless you're covering something up just cuckoo crazy they're a weird family i'm not gonna like (laughs) if anything if they're all completely innocent they're just weird weird people that's all i'll say about it rich people are weird they are he was over at the white's home and around 2 30 p.m the police did go over there and they were able to speak with burke and his parents had no idea but they did question him. And he said he didn't hear anything he had been asleep until the police came so he had nothing to say So at this point, everybody has cleared out. They are starting the official investigation now at 2 p.m., trying to secure the crime scene, bringing in the coroner to do the autopsy, all of that. Okay. The Ramseys are over at the Fernie's house. Now, Fleet and Priscilla White, which was the other set of friends, said they went home. Burke was there, and they sent Burke over to the Fernie's. And then they received a call from Mike Bynum at their home, which they thought was very odd. And he said that they needed to come over and join the family and friends gathered at the Fernie home. So they went over, and they found out that Mike Bynum was basically a lawyer that had been brought in to the Ramseys. Okay. And they said the following day, they were interviewed by a three person team of private investigators and attorneys that had been hired and were representing the Ramseys. I think that's odd. It is odd, but they lawyered up right away. This is a tricky situation. They have money. It makes sense to lawyer up. The daughter was found in the house. Yeah. Part of them had to have known they fucked everything up crime scene wise. I think this is just something rich people do the moment something happens, they lawyer up. Yeah. You could look at it that way. You could look at it that way. I also look at it as if you were not involved and you knew that you were completely innocent and your child was just found dead in your house, wouldn't you want to work with the police? All I can say is that when it comes to lawyering up, we do know that shit can go wrong. Yes. Things are pinned on people. So if you have the means, at least, I don't know, I would probably lawyer up too. Because you never know what cops are going to do. A lot of times they choose someone, even if evidence doesn't point to that person, they'll choose that person. They'll make everything fit for it to be that person. And at this point, you don't know who they're looking at. That's true. And you have an entire family. And he did hire his own private investigators right away, too. Mm -hmm. The one thing that the Ramseys did provide, the police asked for samples of their handwriting because of the ransom note. And John provided a pad of paper that had a lot of Patsy's writing on it. And then I think a couple of his. 
Okay. They also did give blood and whatever, like hair samples, DNA samples to the police. Handwriting is amazing to me because if you come and look at my handwriting, I look like a serial killer with multiple personalities because I never write the same. So I always wonder, how do you go off of that? We're going to go into handwriting analysis. And yes, it is not an easy science. And this is going to be a big part of the investigation. So before moving forward with more details like the investigation and autopsy, I think it's important to discuss the setting of the crime, too. Yep. The Ramsey home was unlike what you and I would consider like a regular single family home. It was a Tudor style mansion that was built in the 1920s and it was 7,240 square feet. Wow. And it's actually been for sale since 2004, I think it was. I looked it up on Zillow. Nobody's lived in it. I just wanted to read the quick Zillow ad. It says, <laughs> stately and modernized 1920s Tudor estate in an epic boulder location on three lots, stunning curb appeal with amazing flat iron views, an impressive boulder estate with timeless appeal in an unbeatable location. It's currently listed at $6.2 million. Like I said, the Ramseys purchased it for $500,000 in 1991. That's crazy. This house is crazy. I was looking at the pictures. They've completely redone it. It does not look anything like it did in 1996. But the house is a maze. Oh. Especially the basement area where John Bonet was found. That's creepy. Also, when they bought this home, they were busy updating it to be more modern. And there were construction crews in the house all the time. Yeah. And down in the basement, especially, there was a lot of like construction equipment left or like painting trays, even like gloves. Yeah. According to family members who had visited and stayed at the Ramsey home, for someone to easily find their way around the basement specifically would be near impossible. It was not set up in any way. And I actually have floor plans that I might share on Instagram, but where she was found is pretty tucked away. Okay. Like if an intruder just came in and was going to kidnap a child and decide to try and get out with them, even if they went to the basement, this would probably not have been the space that they would have chosen. Okay. It's a completely unfinished area of the basement. It's all concrete floors, concrete ceiling. They called it the wine cellar. They didn't really keep wine in there. What it was known for is where Patsy Ramsey would hide all of the Christmas presents for the kids. Oh, so it had been accessed recently. Yes. Okay. There would also be like bags of like your Goodwill stuff that you're going to give away. There were bags of like old clothes and things in there. All right. It's also an area that right outside of there, there was what they called kind of the hobby room. And that's where Patsy's painting supplies because she would paint Mm -hmm. as one of her hobbies was kept. And that will be important when we start talking about the autopsy. Yeah. And then there was a room that Burke had where he kept his train sets. The kids would go down in the basement to play in that one room, and it had a window, and that is the window that when we start talking about intruder theory, most people believe is the window that a person would have come through. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. That's how you know when people are rich because they have rooms for just random things. Oh, my God. A hobby room? (laughs) Yeah. I worked for several people over the years and they all had their own decoration rooms. Like that's where they went and put all the decorations. And (laughs) and those rooms were as big as rooms. Right. (laughs) It was three stories. John and Patsy's room was on the very top floor and basically took the whole part of the floor up. Wow. And then the second floor is where the children were. Mm-hmm. But they were on opposite ends of the house. And John Bonet was in a part of the house that had been renovated recently. So her room was like in the nicer, more modernized part. And then Burke was in the part that was still under renovation. And their rooms weren't like next to each other. They were across the house from each other. And John and Patsy's room was right above Burke's room. But John Bonet's was kind of, it's hard to describe without a map, but it was mm-hmm. it was far enough away that if something happened in John Bonet's room, you might her parents really would not have hear heard it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if something was happening all the way down in the basement, nobody probably would have heard it. Yeah. That is what scares me about big places. 7,200 square feet. Like, that's freaking yeah. huge. Yeah. Technically, four stories because you have the basement. That's a that's lot. That's true. And the basement space. was a full basement. And yeah. Part of it was finished. Part of it wasn't. The other thing is that John Bonet's room on the second floor had a balcony. It was a beautiful balcony. It was like this covered balcony, but it was only on the second floor and it could have easily been accessed. That's scary. I don't know that I would want to put my kid in No. That. Yeah. I don't like the fact that my daughter has a window at all. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> right. <room. laughs> 
They had multiple ways to access the floors. They had the main staircase, which everyone would go up if you came into the home. And then they had this like butler's kind of spiral staircase that came back into the kitchen. Mm. Think of like the old rich homes, right? And that is where the ransom note was found. And there's a lot of speculation about that because for somebody to have known that the family used the back staircase versus the front staircase Mm, okay, gives an idea that somebody had intimate knowledge about what the family did. Okay. So it's a friend, family member, something like that. Also, with the basement and the way that this room was located, there were two detectives who went down in the basement and searched before John Ramsey went down and found John Benet's body, and they didn't even find this room. Right. It was very hidden. And so when they interviewed, for example, Patsy's mom and sister, they even were like, there's no way anybody would have found that room unless they knew the house. Okay. It's just all very curious Mm -hmm. when you think about it. I would, if I was leaving a ransom note, I'd put it on the fridge. (laughs) Yeah, how would you know where to leave it? So the sheer magnitude of the house doesn't really register until you start thinking about this. I read this one fact and it kind of blew my mind. There were nine doors that led to the outside from this home and there were 104 windows. Yeah, that's a big place. How do you secure a home that large and know that... Nobody can get into any of those. So if you want to start talking about the intruder theory of it all, this is a house that would have been easy to access in many, many different ways. And without people hearing you. Right. Why don't they have a dog? They did have a dog. Oh. Interestingly, the dog was staying with a friend the night that John Bonet was killed. Oh. Very odd. I don't know why your dog would be staying with a friend. That is Actually, I know why, because they were leaving town the next day. Okay. So maybe they had already dropped the dog off. That's a valid reason. So something else really important to know about the Ramsey home is that Patsy was part of a local historical society and their home was considered a historical home. And she would open their house up multiple times a year for tours. And anybody can get on those tours. You can just buy a ticket to support the charity and you go and you go through all of these homes in Boulder. Many people had been in their house. But if it's an historical home aren't there rules about what you're changing yes they were doing so much construction what were they doing were they trying to amp up what it already was or were they changing things they were doing things like updating plumbing and electricity you can do all those things in historical homes you just can't change i think there are certain basic layouts right i don't know all the rules but yeah okay buying a historical home you have to have money because you can't do things the cheapest way you have to do it the right way and everything just the permitting process yeah. to do things is insane. I've had to deal with that a couple of times in my jobs. and They had, in fact, opened their home as part of the Christmas tour. And Patsy and the kids were there and welcoming people into their home. So I bring it up just because, yes, it was a maze of a home and not everyone would know their way around. For all you know, when you have a big tour, somebody could have been in there for an hour just walking around your house. Knowing that John Bonet lived there, if they were already, you know, looking at her or whatever. Obsessed with her in some mm-hmm. way. And she was out there in the paper because she had recently won Little Miss Colorado. Okay. So on the morning of the 27th, Commander Eller would hold a news conference on the Ramsey case. The murder had become national news and there were reporters coming from all over. They had issued new warrants to search the Ramsey home. They were collecting evidence. They were questioning neighbors. They were looking up all the sex offenders in the area. They were talking to nannies, pilots, housekeepers, anyone who had worked for the Ramsey family, just to get a list of anyone that they knew of that might have had something against the family. Mm -hmm. They were talking to business associates. They were looking at the access graphics, files, employees that had been dismissed, all of those ideas. I mean, it sounds like they're covering their bases at this point. It seemed that they were. John Ramsey will maintain that the Boulder Police Department never looked at anyone but the family. This Um, is something you will hear him say in every single interview. They looked at a lot of people, over a thousand suspects that they interviewed. They followed all these leads. Okay. So another point that would raise suspicion of the Boulder Police Department is that it is one day later. They have just brought John Bonet's body to perform the autopsy, and they're already getting a call from the district attorney's office. And they're saying that 
The family wants the body released now. They want to bury her. It's been one day. They don't even know how the child was killed. And the Mm. family is more concerned about getting her body back to Atlanta to have a funeral. (sighs) That is so hard. I would want to know what happened to my daughter, but I can't imagine just sitting there and knowing her body's just in a cold room being manipulated. I would feel conflicted. But it's been one day. It's been one day, yeah. And the district attorney, according to the police, is telling them that they're holding the body for ransom because they want an interview with the Ramsey family. And the police are (laughs) like, well, we want to interview the family because they were the ones in the home when she was murdered and we need to establish. Right. That's just (laughs) proper procedure, right? Mm Mm-hmm. This is when they realized there was something going on because the DA shouldn't even be really that involved. The DA, I have learned a lot about our justice system. Maybe I'm ignorant, didn't know all this. But, you know, the DA is the one that gives you warrants and they have to go Mm -hmm. back and forth to like build the case. And the DA completely stopped giving them warrants and started supporting the Ramsey family. Oh. And the police quickly realized that this was going to be a problem. Yeah. As he said, he's like, why were the Ramseys already communicating through the DA's office? And their people, rather than trying to work directly with the investigating detectives who are trying to establish what happened to their child. Yeah. Who's trying to help (laughs) find the murderer? The parents completely cut off all conversations directly with the police. The only communication, this is one day after their baby is found murdered. The only communication happening was between their lawyer and the DA's office. Wow. And his name was Alex Hunter at the time. That's such a... I was going to say that's such a detective name. but <laughs> <laughs> The police maintain that they were just trying to complete due diligence to understand where the family was. They just wanted interviews with each of them and then they would have left them alone. Mm, yeah. But the way that they behaved led them to be even more suspicious yeah, of red the family. Flags. So what did they find in the autopsy? It was completed on the morning of December 27th. John Meyer found that the cause of death of the six-year-old girl was asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral trauma. Hmm. This will also be something that is up for discussion. There would be further analysis of this autopsy by many, many experts. And it was now believed, and I think the most recent theory still, is that she was hit over the head first. Okay. Based on how the contusions happen and the hemorrhaging and the blood and, mm-hmm. you know, all that scientific stuff I know nothing about. They believe that she was completely knocked out and unconscious when she was strangled and that the strangulation was really just the secondary to make sure, purpose to make sure she was yeah. killed. I really hope that she was out. Yes. She was found with a ligature around her neck. They call it a garrote. Mm-hmm. It's not what you would think of as a very complex garrote. It was made from a paintbrush handle Mm -hmm. linked with string. And it was something that any person could put together. And I kept reading everything about, you know, they're like, garrots are a favorite of sexual predators. And then I finally looked at a picture of what it was. It looks like a child's toy. Mm -hmm. It was just very crudely put together, almost like somebody's last minute thought. It wasn't something that like an intruder would have come in with, like already made with the purpose of strangling the child. It was something they literally found pieces of in the right. basement and made. Right. Because it was part of her paintbrushes, right? It was part of Patsy Ramsey's paintbrushes. Right. But to think of making that does say something. Yeah, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay. As far as what had caused the injury to her head, there are different thoughts. Uh, there was a flashlight found in the home. That had been wiped completely clean of fingerprints, Mm. even down to the batteries, which I think is odd. Yeah. There was also a baseball bat found right outside of the small window in the basement that the family claims was not theirs. Okay. It had also been wiped clean of all fingerprints. Why two different things? She was hit once? That they can tell. Okay. She also had abrasions on her right cheek. And then she had some on the front small marks that some believe look like a stun gun Mm. on the front and the back of her body. Her wrists were tied, but they were not tied in a way that would have actually constrained her. That also seemed like an afterthought. They were very loose. And it was said that it was not in a way that would have actually kept her from escaping. It's almost like it was put there to look a certain way after she she was tied up. 
Okay. The other thing found in the autopsy is that they examined her body to look for signs of sexual assault. And the autopsy doctor was not able to definitively say that she had been sexually assaulted. But there was a mucus-like substance in her vagina. It was found to not be semen, but they don't really know what it was. And there was blood in her panties and inside of the vaginal cavity. There was also a splinter found inside Mm. of her vagina. And they believe that she had been assaulted at some point with the paintbrush. wood. Oh, okay. They actually connected it to the paintbrush. Oh, okay. That was also used in the garage. Mucus. You did Mixed say with she, blood. Yeah. Okay. You did say like she had some issues down there. Yeah. She had vaginitis. It, it could have been from that. You know, I guess you can have discharge. Right. They also did find that her hymen had been broken, but that can happen for many reasons other than sexual assault. They did mention that it appeared that she had had trauma in the area that had healed. So mm. that goes with the whole doctor Mm -hmm. reports of her having something going on that could be caused by a lot of UTIs. It could be caused by wetting your pants a lot. And like you can get irritated down there Mm -hmm. in many different ways. She was also found in a pair of white long johns and she was in a white shirt with a star on it. And she was wearing size 12 panties. So they were too big for her. That's and they way big. What the fuck? Yes. And they had the word Wednesday printed all over them. So there were some of those panties that you get, you know, the day of the week. Uh huh. These were not her underwear. Okay. You don't just end up with someone else's underwear. Right. That was, That's a very specific thing then. She was also found with a pink heart on the palm of her left hand, which they believe meant that she drew it herself on her palm. Yeah. Kids do that. Her fingernails were long enough that they were able to cut them to look for DNA under her fingernails. There were no signs of struggle. There was nothing under her fingernails that would have shown that like she had scratched or tried to grab onto her assailant. Mm -hmm. There were no drugs in her system. You would have to assume that everything that happened to her was after she was hit over the head. Yes. That's going to be the big belief is Mm -hmm. that she was hit over the head and then everything else was while she was unconscious. Yeah. They were also able to determine based on how the blood had clotted and things like that, that the head injury had occurred at least one hour before the strangulation occurred. Okay. So somebody had knocked her out, maybe taken her down to the basement at that point. Mm -hmm. Everything else happened. And then the strangulation was kind of like the last thing to really make sure that she was gone. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks to talk about all of this because Mm -hmm. it's a six year old kid. Yeah. It's hard to listen to, but hopefully it was all after she was knocked out. That's I'm just the hoping only thing that helps. That's what I hope is I hope she was knocked out and mm-hmm. nothing else happened. She couldn't and so feel she anything. Just fell and asleep should, and mm-hmm. passed away and has, you know, no idea. Right. So the day of the autopsy, that evening when they had this report, they showed up at the Fernie home. And by they, I mean detectives Linda Arndt and Detective Mason. They arrived at the Fernie home to speak with the Ramseys. They wanted to provide details about the autopsy and set up formal interviews. They were met at the door by two attorneys and they were told that John Ramsey will not talk to them and will be doing all of his communication through the DA's office. They said they thought it was really interesting because the family asked no questions about the murder. They asked no questions about the autopsy. It's like they didn't even want to know how John Binet had been killed. Yeah, that's De- odd. It is odd. Detectives then asked to speak to Patsy, but then her doctor showed up and said she's on medication. She was taking Valium at the time and she is not in any shape to talk to police. They also told them not to bother coming back tomorrow because she would be too fragile to talk then as well. Then the family takes off to Atlanta. They're gone. I have a question real quick going back to Patsy. Why were they still trying to talk to her? Did this whole lawyer in the DA situation with John not cover her as well? They had separate lawyers. Oh, okay. Which is another interesting piece. When they hired lawyers, John had his own set of lawyers and Patsy had her own set of lawyers. Interesting. Okay. That's brought up a lot. People think that's really suspicious and odd, but it's also a rich person thing and John's like, that's what we always do. My lawyer's in my back pocket. It's weird. 
every single thing I read is anyone who observed John and Patsy together, they weren't a couple. Like they weren't loving. They never touched each other. They mm-hmm. never talked to each other. But that could have been their relationship all along. None of yeah. us know. Yeah. She was, you know, maybe just his pretty trophy wife that did everything for him while he traveled and built his empire. Yeah. That's rich people for you sometimes. Yeah. And there are people who are not into public affection. True. Regardless. And everything I see about John Ramsey is he's a CEO. Yeah. And he's an engineer. He's very calculated and just kind of that logical brain. Mm hmm. So I could see that. Yeah. Sounds so boring to me, though. Yeah. (laughs) And then Patsy was kind of the opposite. She was like Miss Extrovert Mm -hmm. out there, socialite, which is great. John Ramsey ends up going into politics later. So it all starts kind of making sense. And she was the perfect wife for someone who has ambitions like that. Gotcha. So the family is taken off to Atlanta and the police never got to question them. This is one of their biggest regrets in the case as well is that they were never able to question the family right when it happened. And they won't get to actually sit down with them for four months. Wow. Which I think is crazy. Yeah. And by then, what they wrote down in the investigative reports on the day that they showed up at the house and what the Ramsey family will say will be completely changed. Okay. Which is really frustrating Mm -hmm. because they lawyered up. And not only did they lawyer up, I haven't even mentioned this yet. They also hired a PR firm. (laughs) Okay. So take with that what you will. (laughs) So after the family leaves, the district attorney office is clear towards the police chief that they need to treat the Ramseys as a grieving family and not look at them as suspects, even though the police at this point actually had quite a bit of evidence that made them want to question the family as potential suspects. Once again, you see this tension between the DA and the police, and it gets really ugly. The police lose the battle. They actually don't get to keep the body of John Binet as long as they were hoping. They thought that they could find more evidence. I mean, the body is a huge piece of evidence in the case. Mm -hmm. But that part of their investigation was cut short, and the DA said, nope, you can't have it anymore. And they had to send her body to Atlanta, and she was buried. Was she buried or cremated? She was buried. Okay. They would have seemed a lot more suspicious if they immediately cremated her. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we've seen families do Mm -hmm. that. So for most of my information about the police work on this case, I did read Detective Steve Thomas's book, and he gave a behind-the-scenes look at what was happening that is kind of hard to gather anywhere else. I also read... Detective James Kolar's book called Foreign Faction. He was a detective that was hired later on by the district attorney's office to perform an investigation. And then finally, I listened to the podcast and read the book Lou and John Binet, which was put out by Detective Lou Smith's family after he actually passed away from cancer. And they're continuing his work still to this day. I feel like I've seen a show about Lou that specifically. Mm -hmm. It's like his daughter or Yes, his daughter and her husband are continuing the work that Lou Smith was doing. So Lou Smith had been brought in. He was from Colorado Springs. He was very successful at cold cases. He had been successful in finding another little girl's murderer like many, many years after. A problem that came up is that Lou Smith was really pushed and hired by the district attorney's office. And a lot of what I saw was that Lou Smith and the district attorney would spend inordinate amounts of time with the Ramsey family. Like the Ramsey family would come over to Alex Hunter's home Mm -hmm. and hang out for drinks. And Lou Smith would go and pray with the Ramsey family. So they were too close. Uh, Okay. And Lou Smith was a hardcore Christian. And Patsy Ramsey and John Ramsey were also Christians. And Lou Smith said that he believes the Ramseys had no involvement because he asked them to swear on God that they did not do anything to their daughter. And he said that was good enough for him. And as soon as they did that, he would never look at them as a suspect wouldn't even entertain any of those theories in his mind. Well, that's shitty police work. (laughs) So (laughs) Lou Smith is a very respected detective out there, but I think in this case, he maybe got a little too close. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. So we have three detectives. I read all three of their books, their theories, the podcast, and we have Stephen Thomas, he believes Patsy Ramsey is responsible for the death of John Binet. Detective James mm. Kolar, he was the detective hired by the DA. He came into the investigation, I think, a couple of years after her death. He would present a new theory that no one else had ever thought about, and that was that Burke Ramsey, her nine-year-old brother, was responsible for John Binet's death. Mm-hmm. And then Lou Smith is the one who started the entire intruder theory. 
He was the first one to come in and say this was done for sure, 100 percent outside person, sexual predator. Okay, And that's where Santa comes in, right? Yes. Okay. So all three of these men had these different perspectives and theories, and they had to all work together. (laughs) So it was really (laughs) interesting. They're also the ones spending day in and day out with the details of the investigation. And even they could not agree on who the perpetrator was. So that just tells you how fucking crazy this is. I do think it's interesting that one of them would focus on Patsy instead of John. I didn't see any detectives that said John, but we will talk about the John theory, too, because I think it has legs. But the detectives never looked at John. Interesting. Patsy is actually the number one suspect that I saw in. I think there have been 51 books written about the John Benet Ramsey, and each book will give a theory. And 13 of them point to Patsy Ramsey as the one who killed her daughter. Interesting. I bet they were like, oh, she was jealous of her daughter and stuff like that. Yeah. So before I go into all the theories, I want to provide a little bit more perspective from the police work that was done in the investigation and just a few more details that might help you decide who you think did it. I'm just like sitting here with like giddy little feelings because I'm like, I have my idea. Is it going to match? Is it going to match? Are we going to think the same thing? That's what I wonder. Mm -hmm. I told you I have gone through every single person and I changed my mind three times. You changed your mind three times, though. But I am now very convinced with my answer that I wrote down at the beginning of this episode. Because I don't know if I've changed my mind too many times. I'm trying to think. It's been a long time, though. I've been listening to this story for like a decade. Yeah. So... I haven't. I came completely clueless, honestly. I didn't even know about the ransom note. That's how clueless I was. Oh, wow. Yeah, you were out of it. (laughs) So I want to go back to the day the murder happened, and I want to give it from the police perspective. So Officer French was the first one on site, and when he arrived, Patsy Ramsey told him about the note and that she had gone upstairs and her daughter was not there. And John Ramsey told him at that time that he had checked the house and it appeared to completely be locked as it had been the night before. He saw no sign of a forced entry or a struggle. So John Ramsey from the get-go was like, nobody came in our house last night. He did say that the alarm system had not been engaged. They didn't turn it on. He said the one time that they had used it in the past like year or so, it had scared the family so bad that they just like basically ripped it out of the wall and were like, we're not using that. So it's just there for decoration. (laughs) Well, for scare. I mean, do they have the signs outside or whatever? So it deters people. They also both said that they heard nothing unusual during the night. Officer French, when opening the door to meet the next sergeant that showed up, he told him it looks like there might be a kidnapping, but something's really off here. Mm -hmm. First two officers on or I guess the very first officer is already like, this is weird. (laughs) Yeah. They called in more backup. And as police continued to arrive, they all took notes about how the family was behaving. And multiple investigators that were there said that the father was calm and composed. And the mother was dissolved on the floor into an emotional mess. She was lying alone on the floor at one point, hugging pillows, clutching a crucifix and just wailing out loud. They also thought it was very odd that while Patsy was basically losing her shit, John never went to talk to her. Never consult her. That is odd. Especially fucked. Especially when you both lost a child together. Right. I don't get that. I don't understand that. I'd either be her or I'd go catatonic and not be able to even move. Reichenbach, who is the second detective that shows up, he and John Ramsey are going to go walking through the entire house together Mm -hmm. and they're going to be looking for clues. So he said they went into John Benet's bedroom together and he said that there were two beds in there, full size. They were parallel to each other and about three feet apart, kind of like a hotel room in a way. Interesting. He said one was completely made up and the other, the comforter was pulled back towards a pillow at the foot of the bed. This will come up later because a lot of people will theorize the way that the bed was left that they think she was attacked in her bedroom Mm. or something happened And if there was any kind of sexual molestation, they believed it happened in the bedroom before the basement. Okay. John Ramsey started ruffling around and he lifted the comforter like underneath to just look under the bed. And at that point, the detective was like, stop touching things. We need to leave this scene now. And he pushed John Ramsey out of the bedroom. He said at that time he went to the bedroom of Burke Ramsey. And he says when he looked in, the lights were off and it appeared that the child was still sleeping. The sergeant continued to walk through the house. John Ramsey at this point had taken a 
a phone call and left. So it was just the sergeant walking by himself. And he said he found no evidence of forced entry. He went outside and he noted that there was a light dusting of snow and there was frost in the grass and there were no footprints. There was no sign of anyone being outside of the house near any of the window wells or where doors could have been accessed. Nothing to indicate a break-in, no broken glass. But he also did notate that it was nine degrees outside. And when he walked on the driveway and the sidewalks, it actually left no visible prints because it was so frozen. Oh, So you can't completely rule out that somebody wasn't there because it was so frigid. Right. He then went down into the basement and he walked through all of it, opening every single door. And he found at the far end, there was a white door that was secured at the top by a block of wood that pivoted on a screw. He tried to open it, but he felt resistance and then kind of just gave up and went upstairs. That would be the room that John Benet's body would be found in. It's very unfortunate that they didn't. You're not searching. I feel like they did a shitty job. Searching everywhere. What the heck? I guess he didn't want to kick it in. I don't Mm. know. They they also thought it was a kidnapping. I think it would have been a different mindset if they were looking for a dead child. I don't know what to think about this because two officers are going to go down there and not see it either. No. Or choose not to get in there further. I get it. If it seems like it's already locked up. Yeah. How can something be in there type of thing? Before John Ramsey would open that door and eventually find John Benet's body, not only would Sergeant Reichenbach have tried to open it, Officer French would also go down there and not open it. And then Fleet White, who was the friend that was with John when they do find the body, Fleet White actually opened the door, Mm -hmm. pushed it open, and he said it was so dark in there you couldn't see anything he couldn't find the light switch that was the other thing I saw about the Ramsey basement is that the light switches were never in a place where you think they would be it's one of those old (laughs) yeah (laughs) or whoever Mm -hmm. finished the basement did a really shitty job and so like he couldn't find a light and he was just like it's just a dark room and close the door and Mm -hmm. he said he could not see anything anything in there but when he's down there with John Ramsey John Ramsey pushes the door just a little bit and all of a sudden starts freaking out and going, oh my God, my baby. So Fleet White will come back later and say that he believes John Ramsey already knew that John Benet's body was in that room because he reacted way too quickly Mm. for how dark that room was. He's like, there's no way he saw her. He had to have known she was already there to start reacting. Mm -hmm. And that's his buddy. (laughs) That's his best friend, who he at one point accuses of killing his daughter, by the way. Oh, so good friends. Mm -hmm. Those detectives were searching the house, not finding anything. The other detectives were concentrated on the ransom note. It was odd. It was way longer. It was very detailed. But further analysis of the ransom note would find that many of the statements, and I didn't write all of this down. There's a lot of detail. If you want to know every single detail about this case, I highly recommend reading Steve Thomas's book. He was sued by the Ramsey family for defamation, (laughs) but so was everyone. I do believe that a lot of his stuff in there is very factual and it's presented in a way to me that's not emotional. It's just like, these are the facts. This is what we did. Mm -hmm. Anyways, they did find out from the ransom note, there were several statements on there that were connected back to movies, including the Mel Gibson movie Ransom had just come out, I think a few months before John Bonet. And there were statements completely like word for word from the note that was left in that movie to the father. Okay. So movie buff. Yes. And there were also references to the movie Speed. If you remember that one, Sandra Bullock. (laughs) And I can't remember the other one, but it was like an old movie, like only somebody who was probably black and white older would have known. Yeah. It was one I didn't know, but it's kind of like a home alone situation going on here. (laughs) Kind of. The other interesting tidbit about the ransom note is that there were no fingerprints on it. The only fingerprints found on the ransom note were from the detective who picked it up. I think that's really odd because Patsy Ramsey should have been on that note if she picked it up, like when she called 911. Uh, Yeah. Hmm. So she was already wearing gloves. (laughs) Maybe. She was still wearing them (laughs) from tampering the crime scene. Maybe she had lotion on. I do know weird people who they put lotion on their hands and then they'll wear gloves for a little bit. So it gets really. She could have been. She was moisturized. (laughs) (laughs) She picked it up with her toes. (laughs) Just (laughs) her mouth. Kitchen tongs. Tongs. I didn't know what they're called. The police did at this time tap all of the phones. They actually put out a 
what's the word? APB. A- yes. <laughs> you you knew what I was going for. Yeah. They shut down all lines of communication because they didn't want the kidnappers to be listening in. Yeah. So they would only be able to communicate to each other through phone call, which made it hard in an investigation. That's why Linda Arndt got stuck there waiting for detectives to come because she only had one way to contact oh, the department okay. and they weren't answering the phone. So a lot of those okay, things good. kind I of was factor like, in here. Uh, this is taking a little long. Are you just... Was she new and she's the girl? Are you like no fucking with her? <laughs> I think some of that too. She ends up leaving the department. So who knows what the politics were, but mm. a not- lot of people give her shit, but I think she was doing the best with what she could. Yeah. So then we know what happens next. They find John Bonet's body, and I've talked about all of that with the autopsy. Something else strange that happened just two days after John Bonet's death, the family had already left flying back to Atlanta. Patsy sent her sister, Pam, to the house because the family, John and Patsy, were not allowed to re enter the home. But for whatever reason, the DA's office made some kind of deal to allow Patsy's sister to go into the home and take things. Like what? She said she was going in to get them clothing for the funeral. This is a family that's a multimillionaire family. You can go buy They can outfit. go buy some new fucking stuff. Yeah. Steve Thomas puts this in his book because he believes that Pam was in there taking specific things that the Ramses wanted mm. taken out of the house. Okay. Specifically. Cash. Well, specifically the clothing that they had been wearing oh. the night they brought John Bonet home from the party. <gasps> Oh, okay. He says that Pam came out with bags and bags of things from the Ramsey household that the police did not tag and write out. So they have no idea what Pam took. She pilfered the crime scene on behalf of the family and they have no idea what they lost in evidence. That's ridiculous. This was all done because the DA was trying to support the family as victims. Pam, what are you doing? (laughs) She's helping them get away with crime. Mm -hmm. So during this time, between December 28th, when they were initially told that they could not interview the Ramses, and then January 1st, this is when John Benet's funeral would be held. And it had come out in the media at this point that the Ramses were not cooperating with the police. They would not provide interviews. And so they were getting bad press. Yeah. And their friends, the Whites, were there. There was an infamous confrontation. I don't know if this was videoed or whatever, but it's talked about a lot. Anyways, after the funeral, they confronted the Ramses and basically said, why aren't you talking to the cops? I don't understand why you're only talking through your lawyers. Like if this was my daughter, I would want to talk to appealing to them as friends. And we're worried about you. Please don't hide behind your attorneys. This is your daughter. Your attorneys are giving you bad advice. Work with the police. That's the only chance you're going to find who killed your daughter. You kind of have to speak up. Yes. They're seeing this happen. These are their close friends. Their right. kids are friends. And they don't understand how they're acting when it comes to their sweet little girl. They, in a way, seem more caring than the parents did. Exactly. And you know what happened just two days after they confronted them? Someone got hurt. John Ramsey called the district attorney's office and said, you need to look at Fleet and Priscilla White. Oh, my God. I think they have something to do with John Benet's murder. Of course. You can't accuse the rich of something or they'll fuck with you. Yes. Even though they're rich, too. But I included this because it speaks to character. Mm -hmm. These are your closest friends, supposedly. Mm -hmm. They helped you. They took your son in while this was all going on. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to accuse them of murdering your child because they called you out for not talking to the police. Like, how is that not suspicious? You're only their friend if they're on your side. Mm -hmm. That's it. As long as it is benefiting them, you'll be in their little space. If not, they could go to the ends of the world to destroy you in whatever way that they want to. It's kind of like a cult. (laughs) <laughs> if you leave the cult, then they'll do everything to destroy you and your name. And when I was reading this book, I liked the way that Steve Thomas put it because he was talking about how they had this whole group of attorneys and this PR firm. And then they had their reverend even would lie on their behalf. They had this like whole cult like mm-hmm. thing. And he just would call them Team Ramsey. If I say that, that's why, because that's in my head is they were team Ramsey. They were like this force to be reckoned with and nobody could fuck with them Mm because they had so much money and the little Boulder Police Department and even the district attorney's office, they couldn't stand against them. Makes sense why he went into politics. Yes. (laughs) 
Interestingly enough, his main lawyer, his name is Lynn Wood, would be the lawyer that would go on to represent Donald Trump during oh. the insurrection okay. of January 6th trial. So that tells you who John Ramsey's buddies are. Yeah. In case y'all can't tell already, I am not a fan of John Ramsey. <laughs> it doesn't mean he did it. Doesn't mean but he's we don't the color, have to be a fan. But the way that he behaved. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean he didn't have a part in it. Correct. While this is happening, let's go back to the investigation. They're in Boulder. They're gathering all the evidence that they can that, you know, Pam didn't like carry off in a plastic bag. And they're trying to collect banking and telephone records. The cops are being blocked by Team Ramsey the whole time. They're trying to get receipts to see if they've bought duct tape. They're just looking for anything that they can. And every time they ask for a warrant, they're trying to get the computers. They're trying to go to access graphics and interview employees. And they're just getting blocked constantly. (laughs) So Steve Thomas at this time asks for permission and they fly out to Atlanta and they're like, well, if we can't get anything in Boulder, let's start talking to family members in Atlanta. So while they're there, they get a call from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and they have determined that the ransom note, the two pages came from Patsy Ramsey's tablet that had been given to them by John Ramsey. It was the main tablet that they left laying on kind of like a kitchen shelving unit. Like a paper Like a a tablet. Paper pad. Yes, exactly. Okay. He also privately informed them that in his opinion, 24 letters of the alphabet look as if they were written by Patsy Ramsey. So this is the first time it comes up that maybe Patsy had something to do with the ransom note. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to talk about it. I know. (laughs) I know. This is one of those things I was like, but I know this and I know this and I'm trying to figure out how to... Writing this and how to unveil it all is really fucking complicated. Yeah, we're sorry if you're listening to the story for the first time in another country or something like that. I know, I think I'm all over the place, but it'll all come together or I'll edit it that way. (laughs) (laughs) One day after John Benet's funeral on January 2nd, John and Patsy Ramsey go on CNN to talk to the world, but they haven't talked to the police. PR. Yes. Steve Thomas says he is struck by the fact that Patsy brings up the case of Susan Smith, who was a mother who staged a story to cover for killing her own children. Mm. Why is she bringing her up? That's what he wants to know. (laughs) She brought it up on the national CNN interview. Like to say, don't worry, I'm not that girl. Something like that. Okay. I didn't watch this specific interview. I should have, but God knows I've watched enough stuff. That's like one of those things. It's like, I wasn't thinking that, but now that you mention it. (laughs) Yeah. And he's like, why would you bring that up? So he's already, remember, Steve Thomas is the one that believes Patsy did it. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the first things because he's uncovering this just, you know, as a detective and he's watching this five days after your daughter's killed and you're like, oh yeah, what about that woman, Susan Smith, who like killed her own children and then staged it? Ha ha. (laughs) Like, why would you bring that up? <laughs> because I'm weird. <laughs> he said, I was just nervous. Um, <laughs> he said he's also struck by the fact that they say this on TV. And I do remember this. They're not angry at the murderer, what? John Benet. They say this. This is something you come to the conclusion of like 10 years down the road where you say, I went through everything. I forgive this Correct. person. This was five days after their child was what? murdered. And they're already talking about forgiveness. And in fact... Patsy says, in a way, John Bonet is better off dead. She doesn't say it specifically. I'm paraphrasing. But okay. here is what she does say. She'll never have to know the loss of a child. She will never have to know cancer or death of a child. I'm glad you're looking at it from a good side. No, what sounds weird. like is they know who killed her. So they're in a weird psychological way forgiving that person publicly. Detective Thomas said he had never seen anything like it. And it was just like, what the fuck? Kind of reminds me of celebrities who say things that make no sense. And you know it's because of like the Illuminati or something. Right. Like it's they're like, required who are you to say of? that. The mm-hmm. other person that does this is John Andrew, who is the oldest son oh, okay. of John Ramsey. Yep. He is also in interviews very soon. I don't think it was this soon, but like within the first month of John Bonet being dead. And he also brings up that we just need to have forgiveness in our hearts for whoever killed his sister. All right, cool. I think that's weird. I'm a fucking parent. And if somebody killed my child, I would not have forgiveness in the first month. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different reasons to decide on forgiveness or not to. Yeah. I think I would only forgive someone who did that to my daughter if I felt like it was severely negatively impacting me as a person to be able to function. And like that was my release. Like I had to. But not after five days. Or like... (laughs) 
you know, your child is hit by a car and you know that person like, didn't that's mean what I'm to. Saying. Different reasons. Your kid's been mm-hmm. murdered and was in your basement, obviously brutally murdered and maybe sexually assaulted and you're mm-hmm. already talking about forgiveness and you no. don't even know who did it. Mm-hmm. Nope. Weird. Yep. So this interview was on CNN and it was filmed while the family was in Atlanta and so the detectives were like let's fly to Atlanta we know the family's there we'll try and get interviews with them as soon as they arrive in Atlanta to try and meet with them they find out that the family has gotten on a private plane and left to Michigan (laughs) okay crazy they're like oh someone leaked it to them guess what (laughs) people are coming leave Remember, Thomas's assertion is the whole time the DA was working with Team Ramsey. So he thinks mm-hmm. and, and the police can't do anything without telling the DA. So oh. there was a lot about this. And in fact, at some point, the governor of Colorado almost brought a case of obstruction of justice against the DA. The DA was definitely oh. in the pockets of the Ramsey family. I have no doubt about that after reading this book. And I could go on about that for a while. There's chapters in the book about it, but I don't have time for that today. But yes, definitely the DA's office was fucked. So they're like, we're already in Atlanta. We might as well talk to whoever we can. Yeah. So they went to talk to the reverend of the church that the Ramseys went to in Atlanta. And he had known the family very well. And as soon as they showed up to talk to him, the reverend's first words were, I'm not sure I want to talk to you and I will share no privileged information. Okay. Are you on the side of a family or God? And that's when (laughs) Detective Thomas was like, is there privileged information? (laughs) He was just being kind of like facetious, like, okay, we're just here. Like he said, we literally just walked in and you're like, I'm not going to tell you anything. It's like, okay, what do you know, dude? (laughs) Anyway, Harrington then said, I'm not going to answer that. Do I need to get an attorney? Sounds like a real man of God. Yeah. They said they got no information from Reverend. But he said, why would a man of God reach for a lawyer rather than give police everything he could in the death of a six-year-old girl? Exactly. He said this was the case everywhere they went in Atlanta. They just kept running into a wall of silence. They tried to talk to John Ramsey's ex-wife, Lucinda Johnson, and they said they could tell that he must have gotten to her first as well. That's why they wanted to get to Atlanta so quickly, because they had other to people shut to shut up. up. You're right. The two people that they were able to sit down with actually gave them some very valuable information, and that was Patsy's mom, Nedra, and her sister, Pam. Oop, they didn't talk to them. <laughs> Pam helped get all the stuff, though. Yeah. John must not have thought about Patsy's side of the family. He's too busy protecting his own ass. They have different lawyers. Yes. I'm sure, if anything, he's like, well, if they're going to pin it on one of us, it's going to be her. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Uh, Maybe. Maybe he wanted her to be the fall girl. He said that when they met with Nedra and Pam, that Nedra was like obsessed with beauty pageants. He said like for the first hour, that's all she talked about was the beauty pageants. Okay. And she would just be showing pictures of like her two daughters, Patsy and Pam, and then talking about John Bonet. And he placated her so he could get through it and start asking questions. What he Mm. did find out from her, she did provide two dozen suspect names. And they were the ones that told him that it would have been impossible for a stranger to figure out where the room was in the basement oh okay and so nedra patsy's mother was like this had to be somebody from the family close friend Mm -hmm. i think they were probably thinking it was a close friend or something she also said that if john benet ramsey had been awakened in the middle of the night the way that that child was she would have screamed bloody murder and people would have heard it she didn't believe that she would have been easily taken into the basement or anything unless it was someone that she knew or she was hit right away that too that would be the other thing They also did mention this was when Pam told the detectives about John Benet having toileting trouble and that she would always ask people to come in and help her in the bathroom. They also gave them a very interesting piece of information in that John Benet's favorite thing to do right before bed was have a bedtime snack. She especially loved fruit and pineapple was her favorite. Mm, I wish my daughter loved pineapple. It's one of my favorite <laughs> it's too. It's so good. It's, it's so sweet. so good. Anyone who knows anything about John Bonet, your ears are perking up when I say the word pineapple. Don't worry. Oh yeah, we'll talk about it. We know about the pineapple. We will get there. So part of the problem with the publicity in a case like this is that the number of tips regarding like creepy men, somebody saying, "Oh, my ex boyfriend was a weirdo." The amount of tips coming into the police was just insane. I imagine. And I'm sure that Boulder is riddled with sex offenders. Detective Thomas says that 
It's also really scary how many actual creeps are attracted to the case when there's a beautiful little six year old girl. Of course. They also, he said the sickos were coming out of the woodworks and he's like, I know they are probably guilty of something, but I can't track down every one of them because they weren't the specific one that killed John Bonet. He's like, I wish I could have put them all in jail because yeah. he tells stories of how disgusting some of these people were that he had to go follow up on. Uh, and he wished they had been connected so he could have like that given gives me them the death shivers penalty. That there's that many people just still out there doing shit. <laughs> This kind of stuff really grosses me out Yeah, because you realize how prevalent pedophilia is Mm -hmm. when something like this happens. It is so prevalent and I don't get it. I don't understand why, but it's massive. Like it's much more common than anything else, I think. Not by women. Right. That's rare. (laughs) It's always men. The whole point of this is that they were getting so many leads and Thomas said they only had five detectives working on the John Bonet case and they really couldn't follow every single lead and they felt like they just kept getting pushed in different directions and they weren't getting the information that they needed from the Ramsey family, which is who was honestly at the time their strongest suspect. And every time they would talk to anybody, they'd give them another list of like 12 people to research instead of helping them move forward with learning more about the Ramsey family. Mm. He said that the private investigators for the Ramsey family actually would send lists of suspects to the district attorney's office. And then the five detectives that were on the case were sent off chasing all these leads that he said were going nowhere. Oh, geez. It was just full of a bunch of these creepy pedophilic men. Sounds like they had one person on staff that their job was to research anyone that could that yes. could have been the person and then hand that over. It was a strategy of deflection. Yeah, it kind of pisses me off because John Ramsey, like I said, still to this day, will say that the police only looked at them. Yeah, that's stupid. Not the fucking case. So we're going to jump way ahead now. Four months. That's what's going on. They're all losing their shit, trying to like chase down hundreds of leads. And they finally, through whatever efforts they were able to go through with the DA, they finally got an interview with the Ramsey family on April 30th of 1997, four months after their daughter was found dead in their basement. And after he filed taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there is a point to that. Who knows? Yeah. The day before Thomas was to interview because he was one of the detectives that got to interview Patsy and John. The day before he was just going through all of his case files. And that's when there was something that triggered. I think just reading through the files, he realized that Patsy answered the door at 6 a.m. wearing the exact same outfit that she had come home from the White's party in the night before. Oh, he thought that was something very interesting Uh, for a beauty queen socialite that had more clothes than anyone. Yes. You don't go to bed in your clothes unless you're drunk. Maybe she was wasted. Maybe. (laughs) That's going to come up in one of the theories about Patsy did it. But the other interesting fact and why I guess his detective ears perked up is because the one piece I didn't mention in the autopsy, because it wasn't part of the autopsy, it was part of the, I guess, the crime scene investigation, is that they found the piece of duct tape that had been put over John Binet's mouth. They determined that the piece of duct tape was put over her mouth after she was either unconscious or dead. The reason being that there were no signs that she had pushed her tongue against the duct tape or tried to move it. And there's a way for them to know by the impressions that that tape was not on her while her mouth would have been moving. Okay. So they know that that was just for staged. Whatever reason. Mm hmm. What they did find were some threads of a red looking material. Patsy was wearing a red jacket sweater thing I don't Mm -hmm. know what to call it when she answered the door that morning and it was also the same like a cardigan yeah it was like a little Christmassy okay blazer maybe shawl yeah something so that was what got his interest he's like wait a minute there's red fabric on the (laughs) duct tape on the inside of the duct tape too right couldn't have been exchanged just by her laying on John Bonet, like when she hugged the dead body. Oh. And the tape was downstairs, so right. Patsy had never gone down there. So we think. As far as the cops had known, right? Right. So now it's time to talk about the pineapple. Something about the autopsy I did not mention until we got to this point was that they did find in John Bonet's system a piece of pineapple. Mm-hmm. 
and it was in the upper part of her stomach, which means that it hadn't started digestion and it had to have been eaten within an hour before her death. Okay. One of the questions that the detectives asked Patsy in their interview was, what is the last thing John Binet ate on Christmas night? Patsy said it was cracked crab at the White's house. Mmm, crab. Yum. <laughs> Rich people. He then asked her about pineapple. And this is where it gets really weird. I don't know why. The family is really weird about this pineapple. <laughs> They all maintain they have no idea how she had pineapple in her system. There was no pineapple. There was no fruit at the White's house, so she couldn't have eaten it there. They don't know how pineapple would be in her system. No fruit? At the... At the White's house? No, she said there was no pineapple there for sure. Oh, okay. It sounds like they had a fancy dinner. They had cracked crab. as probably like a sit-down dinner. I don't mm-hmm. know. But she said definitely she didn't eat it there. And even if she did, that means she would have had to die by like 11 p.m. Mm-hmm. if she hadn't eaten it there. Patsy's like, Nope, I didn't give her pineapple. So then he pulls out a picture from the crime scene and sitting on one of the kitchen tables is a bowl with fresh cut pineapple and milk in it. Like pineapple with milk poured over it, which I think is really weird. But anyways, and there was a glass of iced tea next to the bowl. In the bowl, it looks like something that like, I'm going to sound really sexist here. looks like something that like how a man would have put it in the bowl or how a kid would have put it in the bowl. It does not look like the way that a mom would go and prepare the snack. It was too much pineapple for the bowl and mm. there was a huge spoon like a serving <laughs> yeah. size spoon and, in and it. And kids are obsessed with big. their cutlery for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> they want bigger things when they're eating stuff. It's funny. When the police dusted it for fingerprints, there were two sets of fingerprints on them. One was Patsy Ramsey and one was Burke Ramsey. Mm -hmm. Patsy seemed a little taken aback when the detectives were asking her about this. And she looked at the picture and she said, I would never serve pineapple that way. If I had made a bedtime snack for John Bonet or Burke, it would have been on separate plates. Her fingerprints could be on the spoon because she put away the dishes. The spoon had no fingerprints. Oh, where was the fingerprint? It was on the bowl. Oh, same thing, though. And that's what I believe. It's like she's the mom. She probably puts the dishes away. Even if she didn't put away the spoon, she might have touched that dish at some point, moved it out of the way, put it back. We're constantly moving things around in our kitchen. Exactly. And the spoon having no fingerprints to me means somebody wiped it. Why would you wipe the, I guess, whoever did it forgot to wipe the bowl. The other thing found next to this bowl of pineapple, I'm just going to bring it up since we're talking about it, was a box of tissues. And they were also completely wiped clean of fingerprints. Hmm. And they know during the autopsy, another piece, because there were so many pieces I didn't get to cover. John Bonet did have like a runny nose. So they believe whoever fed her the pineapple also gave her the box of tissues and then apparently wiped them clean because there's no fingerprints. The other inconsistency in the police interview with Patsy is that she now had a different story for what happened when they arrived home. Originally, when the cops showed up and they were asking questions, both Patsy and John, two separate detectives, I think it was two or three detectives, all wrote down like what happened the night. And they both said separately to all of these detectives that when they got home, the kids were awake and they put John Bonet to bed. Okay. Patsy also said that at that time, she left John Bonet in her red turtleneck and changed her into the white long johns, which we know when her body was found she was in a different shirt right that makes me think that maybe john bonnet got up and changed herself because my daughter does this all the time if she's too hot she'll get up and go change herself get back in bed and a turtleneck's hot yeah and they did find the turtleneck balled up in her bathroom okay and i I believe that too yeah but there's another theory that we'll get to that's why i I have to bring all these things up so that the theories make sense okay i'm building a story here i know but kids are capable of taking care of themselves in some way or absolutely (laughs) even at six my kids yeah i come in and they would be stripped down naked because they got hot i mean (laughs) usually that's what happened but every now and then she will get up go get something else from a drawer and put that on instead so they're just little people and little people (laughs) especially children they love to change their clothes a million times a day So during this interview, Patsy changed her story and she said when they arrived home, John Bonet had fallen asleep in the car and that she wasn't even awake and that John carried her upstairs into her bedroom. Patsy changed her into the long johns and then she left her in a white long sleeve shirt that she had worn to the White's house. Oh, this was the first time the police had heard that John Bonet had fallen asleep in the car and that she was carried to bed and that her clothes were changed because on December 26, Patsy had told the police that John Bonet had gone to bed wearing the red turtleneck, which was later found balled up on the bathroom sink. How can they change what she was wearing? Are there not pictures from this evening? 
this is the reason because there were pictures of what John Bonet was wearing to the White's party, and she had been in the little white shirt with the star that she was found in. Oh, gotcha. But Patsy had said she was in a red turtleneck. Oh, so she couldn't even remember what her own daughter was wearing. And there was a red turtleneck that they found at the crime scene. It just, to me, all this speaks to is the fact that they've had four months to sit there and look at all the evidence and put a new story together that fits the narrative that makes them look more innocent. Okay. The other thing that I haven't gone into here is that the police, all of the evidence that they were found in order to get the interview with the Ramses, the requirement was that the police had to release all of their files to the Ramsey attorneys before they could get an interview. And they had to do this like a month before. So they had all this time to set up a... Yeah. It's fucked. That is fucked. And it's also unprecedented. This would never happen in any other case. If this was a family that only made $50,000 a year, Mm -hmm. they would have already been in jail. Yep. That's what money gets you. He asked Patsy about her clothing Uh and what she had worn on the 26th. And that's when he said she got kind of flustered. And that's what he was looking for. He said that he could tell they were well prepared for the interviews. They avoided giving any specifics. They had obviously been coached by their lawyers. They would answer questions very noncommittally. So he'd be like, do you remember checking the doors that night? And they would be like, well, I think I did, oh, but I'm not very, for sure. Very vague. Well, I think I changed her shirt, but I can't remember. That red turtleneck on the bathroom, maybe that's what she wore the night before. And then John was like, I thought I read to the kids, but I think she was asleep. I must be thinking about the night before. So they were doing mm-hmm. things like that okay. to protect themselves. And the detectives were kicking themselves in the butt because they hadn't been able to talk to them sooner. And they knew that this wasn't going to get them anywhere. Why are they kicking themselves in the butt? They literally weren't allowed to. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I guess they could have pushed harder. But what what could they Mm -hmm. have done? They couldn't because the DA's office was not letting them. Mm hmm. So then when he started interviewing John, John also had some inconsistencies. The day that it happened, he was adamant and told the investigators that he had checked all of the doors on the first floor as he did every night and made sure that they were secure before going to bed. And then in the interview with the police, he was like, I don't think I checked everything. So Um, he wanted to leave it open. mm -hmm. And then he also brought up the fact that down in the basement, there was the one window in the hobby room that had been broken. Mm -hmm. And he says that he broke that window months ago and had not gotten it fixed. He broke it one day when he had locked himself out of the house and he broke the window and scooted in through that small window to let himself into the house. Yeah. And this is kind of like an awning window. It's so tiny. it's a small rectangular window the that cops, you would imagine in a basement. Yes. Okay. And we're going to get into this during the intruder theory because the cops actually tried to recreate that and barely any of them could even fit through the window. Mm-hmm. You'd have to be a pretty small guy. Right. They don't even believe that John Ramsey probably could have fit through there. They think that part of the story was probably made up. Okay. But why? Should have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I gained weight. Can't fit in there now. (laughs) I used to be a lot thinner. (laughs) At the end of the interviews, Detective Thomas asked both Patsy and John if they would be willing to take a lie detector test. And Patsy said, I'll take 10 of them. Give them to me. I didn't kill my daughter. Mm -hmm. John, on the other hand, had a very different reaction. He got very angry. And I think people do this when they're kind of guilty. I don't know. (laughs) He acted all insulted. I can't believe you would even ask me to take a polygraph test. I'm the dad. Why would you ever believe that I would kill my own child? That kind of bullshit. It's also the arrogance of why are you wasting my fucking time? Later, both Ramses would deny and they would say this on some other interview that they do that they had cooperated completely with the police. And if they had ever been asked to take a polygraph, they would have gladly done so. But the police never asked them to. (laughs) Okay. So the Ramses, just one day after the interview with the police, showed up on television again to give an interview. Hmm. And here's what I think is really telling. Patsy showed up for the interview on TV wearing the exact same outfit that she wore when talking to the police the day before. Oh, this is like that Illuminati shit. This is some bullshit. Yeah, this is. Why did she do that? Hmm. Thomas feels like it was a strategic move because he had brought up the fact that she was wearing the same outfit from the night before and then the next morning. And they wanted to prove that Patsy wears the same outfit all All the time, time. (laughs) you know, because she's so wealthy and that's her favorite outfit. Yeah. 
And with that, we are getting long on the recording and we have a three hour limit on YouTube. So we're going to have to stop for today. We have to. We don't want to. We're sorry. We're going to have to make you wait a week because this episode is going to be so long. I'm going to need the time to edit it. (laughs) And the next story will come out next Tuesday. So stay with us. Listen to part two of John Binet. We have many, many other things to discuss. I think that's when you're going to hear us get pretty passionate about who we think it is. Yeah, it's time to get into all the theories. And Jessica and I will reveal who we believe it is. And we'll find out if we think it's the same person. It better be. That's all I got to say. I think we think alike, but. Yeah, if it's not who I think it is. We're breaking up the band. (laughs) It's fucked up. Gosh darn it. Thank you for listening. You know where to find us. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube, all at Lucid Lab Podcast, one word. Thank you. Please go leave a review or five stars, whatever. Mostly on Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, if you can just like two seconds. It takes two seconds. Please, please, please. Five stars. And then please send in your lab reports to lucidlabpodcast at gmail.com. And this is our last 2000. I know. And 23 posts. How did that happen? No idea. It's going to be 2024 when we talk to you next. My goodness. I hope this year was good. This year was fucked, in my opinion. (laughs) (laughs) But I feel like I've said that the last four years, to be fair. I don't know. I mean, this year was challenging in so many different ways. It wasn't one thing or another. It was like a culmination of so many things. And so many things changed for me. Not you. Like, I mean, maybe for you, but my entire world changed this year. It did. But we also started Lucid Lab this year. Mm -hmm. So that's a very positive thing to look back at 2023 for. This was the beginning of our podcast. And we made it happen amongst all of the things you're saying, like this whole life changing year for Jessica. I've had my own things with work changes, layoffs, stuff like that going on. We have stuff every year. And then you add on top of our personal lives, all the shit that's going on in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And we're just happy to have survived 2023. And (laughs) yeah, and we're glad for all of you who have joined us for this first year of our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not promoting that 2024 is going to be any better. I think it's going to be a shit show. (laughs) But please stay with us. Have a couple laughs. Learn some shit. Who knows what we're going to talk about is going to be erased and some other version of history. Yep. But we love telling these stories. We love researching it. And talk to us. Send us your comments. Send us anything. Send us your stories. Send us your love. Send us your hate. But don't do it out publicly. Send it to (laughs) us personally. We can take it. Take a moment. You made it. We did. We made it. We made it. And my birthday is just around the corner. So say happy birthday to me. And we We will will see you next week with part two. Yes, come back, listen to more. And in the meantime, stay lucid, baby. Happy New Year. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot 